Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. Oh no, I will never forget this show as long as I live. An amazing show. NWA World Championship Wrestling, August 6th, 1988. Should I give the date of that Superstar show in case anyone wants to look up the crush You may promo? as well. I, I did it on Thursday, but go ahead. June 20th, 1992, everyone. The crush promo is worth checking out, and that is all. Okay, moving on. NWA World Championship Wrestling, August 6th, 1988. Watch this entire show from start to finish, please. Have a recap of Dusty Rhodes laying out Gary Hart and challenging Ronnie Garvin. We go to the studio where the announcers are talking about the bash and cars all over the country and who's on this show. And they very casually mention, out of nowhere, Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch, the Texas Outlaws, have reunited. Yes. Do you know why, Vinny? I don't. Okay. Well, if you watch this show, you still don't. But I'm going to no. tell you what happened, okay? Okay. So first off, they alerted us that David Crockett is on assignment, and so he's yes, not sir. here tonight. So here's the story of the Texas Outlaws getting back together, which, by the way, they didn't fucking tell you. I'm going to tell you. So you remember that match they were promoting forever, Dusty and the Sheik versus Murdoch and Sullivan? Yes. Okay. So they do this match. It's a cage match. They've been hyping it up on TV for fucking ever. You and me, we both want to, like, find a way to buy it and pay for it on pay-per-view. we just dying to see this match, okay? The match went three minutes and 55 seconds. Hmm. Three minutes and 55 seconds. Dusty Rhodes pins Kevin Sullivan. And as soon as he gets the win, the Sheik turns on Dusty and attacks him. Murdoch, who is on the other team... Then makes the save for Dusty to reunite the Texas Outlaws, and I guess they run off the heels, and that's the angle. That's okay, how they then. got back together. That's the whole fucking story. You know what? Murdoch actually covered that in his promo later, but I assumed there had to be more. No, that's there it. There had to be something I was missing after these men had been feuding for like 20 years now. Well, they've been feuding, but they were also, as Murdoch noted, the greatest tag team to ever step foot on the earth. They and were. even when they fought each other, he said, we did it on our own. They were honorable. He was an honorable scoundrel. And now he's back to being a friend of the American dream. I guess so. All right. Let's begin with the wrestling. The Varsity Club versus Bob Emery. And Brad Holiday. Brad Holiday, you say. Brad Holiday. Everyone pay attention. You may want to take notes during the show. I'm going to have a lot to say. Brad Holiday. So I'm looking at Brad Holiday. And Brad Holiday has uh, a blue singlet. Yep. And black tights. Yes. And white boots. Yes. And the first thing I thought was, Shoulders Torelli had a black singlet. And blue tights and white boots. Yes. So the top and bottom were flipped, but otherwise we had basically the same gear. Yes. Then I watched him wrestle, and we were about as good. <laughs> well, Vinny, I think you were a little better than Brad Holiday because he okay. fucking sucked. He did. And Sullivan and the Varsity Club took particular glee in beating the shit out of him. <laughs> yeah, absolutely did. Bob Emery has a physique, and he got in there... And Rick Steiner actually gave him a couple of spots before they yeah. before they, they gave him a lariat, and then they had him tag in his other idiot friend, Brad Holiday. And as soon as they got Brad in, they were like, we're going to kill this fucking guy. And they beat the shit out of him. They beat him inside the ring. They beat him outside the ring. And then they pinned him. Yes. <laughs> that was the story of this match. Brock Lesnar did not invent Suplex City. It was founded here on this NWA show in 1988 as they belly-to-bellied -belly him and they german him and they butterfly suplexed Mr. Brad Holiday. And uh, I, don't even, I don't even remember which one finished it. I wrote, they suplex him to death and pin him. A tremendous squash. Little did I know. So this whole time during this match, I should, I should also add, by the way, uh, this period in the beginning when Steiner was giving Bob Emery offense, they, they, they've, they've always kind of hinted it, but it was very strongly pushed this week. 
that Rick Steiner is the whipping boy of the varsity club. He's the one they abuse and make fun of, and 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 they bury him constantly. So that were the that path is starting now. The other thing here is that Kevin Sullivan was distracted during this match. He had a, a note or a letter or some paperwork that he kept glancing towards in his hands. He was not paying much attention to the match, except when he had to beat up Brad Holiday. So, the Which, by the way, trumps everything else. <laughs> it was the most important thing they had to do today. Then they do a promo, and Rotunda and Steiner start talking about some letter that was sent to some lawyer. It was never established what this letter was or who sent it or what it had to do with anything. Then they started arguing about who was going to defend their title against Dr. Death in Oklahoma because Steiner is still still the Florida champion and insists his belt is more important than Rotunda's TV title. And finally, they start arguing about who did or did not graduate from college and Sullivan pulls Steiner away and Rotunda's very confused, but then says something about how he's going to beat Dr. Death, and it's over. Sullivan grabs center and goes, not today, dog face, and he drags him off. They were busy arguing about college, and Rotunda's claiming that Steiner never graduated from college, and even if he did, it was Michigan and not Syracuse. And the fans are totally behind Rick Steiner. Like, they, they've already chosen their side. They, they laugh at the things that he says. They're, they're into him. They hate Rotunda. Rotunda actually is a great heel. I, I hated him when he was first in the varsity club. I've I've I've, ch- I've turned the corner on this guy. He's I told a, you. You were right, Vinny. I will give it to you. You were right about this. The, but, the varsity club are awesome. Yes. This was a strange promo, though. Well, sure. They're oh, they're strange. So <laughs> they're a very strange crew. There's no doubt about that. But they, they 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 are distinct characters who have they have a level of infighting where it's not the kind of infighting where you think they've broken up and you're surprised to see them back together next week. There's just a constant underlying tension between the two. But at the same time, there is no doubt that when they are on the same page, they will beat the fuck out of you. Sounds like us. <laughs> I suppose it does. Now then, back to the wrestling. The Sheep Herders versus Tony Super and Brett Holiday. <laughs> Excuse me, Brett Holiday? <laughs> now, when this first came up, <laughs> I thought the graphic guy screwed up. And he put in the name of the guy from the opening match. But then he looked, and it was not the same guy. No. But it was a guy in black and blue gear with white boots. <laughs> yes. So let me get this perfectly clear. <laughs> they brought in a tag team, Brett and Brad, the Holiday Brothers, in matching gear. And they had a hole in their card for a tag team squash. But they broke up the holidays, <laughs> and they put one holiday in the opener, and they grabbed the other holiday and put him here with Tony Suber. Why? Well, when I saw it, I immediately thought it must be a rib. Like, how could we possibly have two holidays on the same show? Like, it's just ridiculous. But then they're dressed the same, and so the presumption is that, well, I mean, maybe they're a brother they're a they're a jobber brother tag team. Yeah, <laughs> this is not like the conquistadors, who you presume are not related, but they're both trying to conquer NWA or something like that. These are a brother. They didn't even come out with each other. No, there was no there was nobody alerting us that hey, it's Brad Holiday, the brother of Brad Holiday in the opening match. Yes. None of that. No. They, they just showed a Brad Holiday and a Brad Holiday. It was fucking bizarre. Crazy. So, Brett Holiday, who was in this match, is fatter than his brother, Brad, who was in the opener. We don't know they're brothers. This is a presumption. I am presuming, but I'm going to presume they're brothers until I am proven wrong. So, Brett may have actually been fatter than Shoulders Torelli. But he oh, he was for sure fatter. He had Shoulders tan, though. He's very pale. So because Brett Holiday was in there, I mean, he wasn't, like, abjectly horrible or anything, but he was Brett Holiday. So Tony Super got to run wild. Tony Super's a big feeder pounder who's bigger than half of the stars in this show. So the Sheep Herders gave him a ton of stuff. He, and he actually did run wild at one point on the Sheep Herders, doing drop kicks and shoulder tackles and stuff. And finally, Brett Holiday tagged back, to, back in, and he was eventually pinned with a gut buster. I don't know if you noticed, Vinny, but there were no stars on this fucking show. 
No, no, that is well. In hindsight, I didn't notice at the time, but when I go back over this, the, yes, the, the very top guys were not in the studio. There were there were a ton of people that didn't show up this week, and I don't know why. I do know that a lot of guys had not been paid what they were supposed to. Oh. Like, like shit's going down right now in the NWA. Yeah. For those of you watching, in 1988, uh, Robert Gibson quit. Because I guess he did a week of bashes and got paid eleven hundred dollars and was like fuck this and he quit. And Ricky, I don't think has quit yet, but uh, he's probably going to quit. I actually don't remember if he quits or not, but Robert's gone for now. And it was it was it was a very in the Observer this week. Dave just just said a bunch of guys didn't show up, and he didn't say why. I don't know why. But, I mean, based on what was going on, I wouldn't be surprised if a bunch of guys were just like, you need to fucking give us our money or we're not coming to the studio today. But one way or the other, a shit ton of guys didn't show up this week. And so what they did was they had jobbers winning fucking matches we're going to get to. They had the fucking holiday jobber brothers working in two matches. Like, if you didn't notice, that's pretty impressive because... Like, they, they, they would do interviews with the big stars, but they were all at some other arena taped somewhere else. Like, nobody was there. This explains so much about this show. Because we had a number of guys who had no business being on TV, as we shall get to, being on TV. We had, as you noted, all the stars who did appear. They were they were appeared via pre-taped segments from other shows. Yep. And as you noted, they threw a bunch of choppers in the ring and had a match, which we shall get to down the line when we get to it. So the Sheep Herders here, they did show up, and they did win the squash, and they cut a great promo. Now, before we get to the promo, I want to mention that what I loved about watching this show was, like, we we come in here and we make fun of the fucking horrible jobbers every week, and we, we point out the guys that are decent, and it is fun to watch the show sometimes and realize that we're not just being, like, assholes when we talk about how people suck. You can, oh, no. you can watch the show... And, like, the Sheep Herders respected Tony Suber. They, they, he was a jobber, but they gave him stuff, and then they got him out of the ring, and they beat the shit out of the other guy who sucks. Same thing happened in the opening match. They had respect for Bob Emery. They gave him a couple of things. They had no respect for Brad Holiday. They beat the shit out of him. So we're not wrong here, everybody. We're just telling oh, no. you what we're seeing. And it's clear, by the way, that the wrestlers deal with the jobbers, who they think is good and who they think fucking sucks. So the Sheep Herders are bloody well completely upset that the Midnight Express are getting a tag team title shot, and they are not. Again, th- this whole thing with the Midnight Express challenging the Horsemen has changed the perspective for every tag team on the roster. It has shaken things up greatly. Uh, the Sheep Herders say they have won titles in 38 countries. If they're not getting a title shot, they're going to start crippling and hurting people. A crippling. Co- Excuse me? A crippling. A, a crippling? <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're not going to be crippling. They're going to start a crippling people. A, a crippling. I stand corrected. My mistake. Uh, they call it the Midnight Express, the Rock and Rolls, the Four Horsemen, and they're sure to add, you Yanks are nothing but bloody scumbags and dirt beneath our shoes. You know what I love about the Sheep Herders? Promo. I love that Like if you watch the Rock and Roll Express, Ricky does all the talking, and Robert just stands there and yes. looks at the camera, and he doesn't do anything. And Ricky's got to carry the whole thing. The sheep herders, Luke doesn't talk, but he doesn't just stand there. Like, Butch is cutting this awesome promo, and Luke yeah. is standing there, and he's like marching in place, and his yeah. eyes are wide, and he's showing yeah. that he's missing teeth, and he's just being like yeah. a crazy man. It's fucking great. He's cackling, he's giggling, he's marching, he's snorting. He'll, every once in a while, he'll repeat something that uh, Butch says. Yes. But will say, all you Americans are bloody Yanks. And Luke, you know, bloody Yanks. <laughs> this, is the best, this is the best act. That's fantastic. And by the way, Rip Morgan, their new flag bearer, a much better fit and, and, and a much better character than Johnny Ace. Yes. Johnny Ace sometimes was funny, but in a, in a so horrible it's funny kind of way. Rip Morgan is just a young sheep herder in training. He's he's not as wacky as they are. He's not as good as they are. He's bigger than they are. But but he, he's he's down that same the the, the, the same wacky path that the sheep herders have gone down. So this was awesome. So they finished at a promo, and Jim Ross goes, "Sounds like they spent too much time in the sheep shed." 
and smells that way too. It's like, <laughs> what? I understand the smell line, but what the fuck does spending too much time in the sheep shed mean? You have to ask the sheep herders, I guess. And what do you? They're sheep herders. What do you think sheep herders spend time? Brad Armstrong versus Joe Cruz. Sucked. <laughs> Sucked. It was a bad. Brad Armstrong is so bad at doing squash matches. He has 7,000 arm bars and one with a leg sweep. The highlight, if you want to call it that, was Jim Ross trying to explain why a guy as talented as Brad Armstrong, who has the win loss record of Brad Armstrong, why he's never had uh, any you know championship opportunities, if, if you want to use that phrase in 1988. He explained. Armstrong was getting bad legal advice. Oh. Now, I think he meant like like an agent. <laughs> Somebody who's not booking him in the proper matches, but it sounded as if like he was in trouble with the law. <laughs> well, maybe he was. <laughs> he was wanted in some states. I don't know. But bad legal advice was a strange line. Oh, Kevin Sullivan versus J.C. Wild. <laughs> you know, if I didn't hate, oh. if I didn't hate this J.C. Wild idiot enough... And he, he, I believe, is the guy that we determined was the worst of the worst of all time. Right? Same J.C. Wild? Uh, as of a few weeks ago, I believe we said that, yes. Okay. This asshole, God bless him. I'm sure he's a nice guy. But when he showed up in fucking cowboy boots, I was just like, there's no... Here's here's my theory about what happened in this match, okay? D- did you forget he's worn those before? Uh, apparently I did. Okay. I think what happened is that Kevin Sullivan was in the back and he saw J.C. Wild putting on cowboy boots, okay? J.C. Wild is a jobber. He's not a star. He's not a fucking cowboy. No. What is he wearing fucking cowboy boots for? I imagine Kevin Sullivan looking over that guy and and going right up to the crocus and going, I want J.C. Wild tonight. And they said, all right, Kevin. And they put the match together. There's no way in watching this match that Sullivan did not request it. He fucked this guy up. He sure did. He beat the shit out of him. He goes over and he picks up the wooden, it's a giant wooden podium. Not a little thing. But he's a strong man. He picks up this giant fucking podium. He throws it across the studio right at J.C. Wilde. Knocks, knocks him over with this fucking thing. The the referee, Teddy Long, just stands there. They go in the ring. He's given him a beating. And finally, like, I get this. Maybe nobody else does. I get it. He went to throw a chop. A chop. And J.C. Wilde put his hands up. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> he put his hands up to block the fucking chop. He still takes the bump, mind you. And Kevin Sullivan looks down at him and he leaps high in the air and he gives him a double foot stomp right in the gut. Right in the softest part of the belly as this guy is laying flat. He fucking kills him and then he stands and puts a boot on him and he gets the pin. I could have watched this a thousand times. (laughs) So Kevin Sullivan. When no one was seriously him? injured, everybody. Nobody was seriously injured. I could watch it a thousand times. Uh, a man was solidly beaten, which is the whole point of professional wrestling. This is how a man gets solidly beaten. I just sat there in the crowd and chanted, you deserve it. <laughs> so Kevin Sullivan, when you look at him, he's clearly a very, very thick man. I, I'm sure when he gets this deadlift and, and squat and bench are just ridiculously huge. But he's not very tall, and he always could. He has these crazy promos, but they're more silly than crazy, as we'll get to right right after this. But he he comes off. He doesn't. He never comes off as the scariest guy in the world. He's not the Road Warriors. He's not Ronnie Garvin on the on this show, except for this week. Kevin Sullivan was the scariest human being in the world on this show. You didn't even talk about when he clotheslined J.C. Wilde's head off. I'm sure when they when, when like a uh, uh, Ring of Honor has done shows, I believe in in, in the in the studios or maybe it's NXT. Somebody's still done doing shows in recent history in in these very studios, and I'm sure somewhere under one of these chairs when they clean up the show and they're putting things away, they found J.C. Wilde's head. 
because Kevin Sullivan took it off for the clothesline in 1988. Just destroyed this man. Also, not necessarily relevant to the match, but it still made me laugh. Uh, Jim Ross compared Kevin Sullivan to an NFL linebacker. And we're sure to mention, like, he was an old school NFL linebacker. He, named, he, he started dropping names like Sam Huff and Ray Nischke and guys from the 60s. Because one thing never changes. And that's that whatever sport you're talking about, the old guys were always tougher. It just made me laugh. So I mentioned it here. So then we get a Kevin Sullivan promo. May I? Have at it. I'm going to do my best. Tell me if I missed anything. Okay. He says, I used to believe in the American dream that if you worked hard and did right, you'd get a big house and a two-car garage. But the only thing you get if you believe in the American dream is the shaft. When I was floundering in the sea of life and didn't know where to go, I went to Asia. I met the Abuda Dean, who told me the American dream was dead. It was nothing but a lie. He took me to the lady with the third eye. I laid with her for 13 days and 13 nights, and she taught me things most men do not know. I ate monkey brains. I laid with the lepers to purge myself of the American dream. I've never lied, and I have this paper. Patty, I'm your friend. You don't have to come into the lion's den anymore. I am giving this paper to Jim Ross. Read this paper and weep. You know where I'm coming from. And Dusty Rhodes, the American dream is dead forever in my eyes. What the fuck was he talking about? <laughs> okay, you got most of it. You got most of it. Uh, did you get the part where he said he went to the Ganges River and bathed with the dead? You know, I tried, but like <laughs> I couldn't figure out what the fuck he was talking about, and I rewound it too many times, so I just gave up. <laughs> How about, I, you may have said this, when he ate monkey brains with the blind man. Yes. Okay, you get that part. Laid down with so, the lepers. As noted, I want all of you to take time out of your Monday or your Tuesday to load this episode on the network. And watch it, because it's important you do. When you get to this segment, you can listen to what Kevin Sullivan is saying, but don't look at Kevin Sullivan. I want you all to look in the upper left-hand corner of the screen where Jim Ross's face is in view. <laughs> yes. And yes. I, don't know, I don't know how much of this he knew Sullivan was going to say and how much of it was just off the cuff. And Ross I bet he didn't know totally anything that he was going to say. Well, he clearly was stunned by it all. And sometimes shocked, and sometimes appalled, and sometimes amused. It was nuts. <laughs> Kevin Sullivan's out of his mind. He's awesome. But the but the point of, he well, he certainly is. The point of all this, and there actually was a point buried deep beneath all this. The point of all this was that he gave a piece of paper to Jim Ross, and he wants Patty to go to Jim Ross and read that piece of paper. And I'll say this for Ross. If this had happened to me and I had been Jim Ross and Kevin Sullivan gave me a piece of paper, I'd have read that immediately on the air. Jim Ross is a more honorable man. This is not His message is not for him. He is merely a courier. And he will get it to, to Patty because it was never mentioned again. <laughs> oh, and also in here, somehow Kevin Sullivan found time to call out Dusty Rhodes. Yes. Always mention Dusty in your promos. So now we are interviewing Lex Luger in an arena somewhere. Uh, it's funny because Lex and Flair both did promos from this arena. And Lex, in his promo, talked about watching Flair cut his promo. So clearly, in real time, Lex cut his last. But then here on this show, they aired his first. So he repeated his lines. Ric Flair wants to ride limousines and fly private jets. I'll take a taxi and I'll fly commercial. All I want is... I want a stipulation that the match will not be stopped for blood loss. And he, and he still didn't even flat out say those words. He just kept saying, there was only one stipulation I want. Rick, you wouldn't want this match stopped on blood. I don't want to just say, if there's a little trickle of blood coming out of your head, I don't want to see this match stopped. But he never actually said that was a stipulation. That's two interviews in a row where he hasn't actually said what it is. Yeah, he started teasing Flair about getting used to life without that belt because he's going to take it away from him. I am not making this up. A tag team match then aired, pitting Tommy Angel and Bob Riddle against Mike Jackson and Curtis Thompson. When this match starts, Jim Ross says, Fans, 
You recognize these men. But you're probably wondering why they're facing each other. He then spends several minutes explaining that these are young guys who make sacrifices. They toil away in the gymnasium. They're toil. trying they to toil. move up the ladder and impress promoters. Mike Jackson here. He is the Alabama junior heavyweight champion. These men, they're just trying to do their best and make their name. Meanwhile, they're having a match that like had to have thousands of people had to turn off the television. But it was actually a pretty fun little match. It was a fun TV tag match. Yep. And then at the end, Curtis Thompson, the big jacked up dude who gets his ass kicked every single week on the show. Mike Jackson does a move. He hands it over to Curtis Thompson. Curtis Thompson hits a power slam. Curtis Thompson gets the pin. He is so happy. He jumps in the air. He hugs Mike Jackson. He puts his head in his hands. He cheers and looks up at the sky. I was so happy when this was over. And Ross goes, probably the biggest win of young Curtis Thompson's career. And I was like, no shit. Maybe the only one. But but God damn it, you know what? He had a match and he won and it was great. And and they should do this like every four months. Some jobber should win another match. They've done it before. But, like, they never do anything with it. Like, Tony Super right. won a match, and there was no follow-up. And the Mulkies won a match, and there was no follow-up. Now Curtis Thompson has won a match, there's no follow-up. Curtis Thompson's probably so happy all these fuckers didn't show up here today. So, yes, when this match began, first I was just completely gobsmacked. Then I started to think, because I have seen on the rare occasions something like this airs on an NXT or a SmackDown or whatever... I'm trying to think, who is the big, scary monster that's going to run and kill everyone? Is this, is, or is there a new Russian? Uh, does, does Sid show up at some point this year? Is, is Dr. Death doing his heel turn? No. They got five minutes to do a tag match. They had a completely non-formulaic, non-formulaic 19, for, for the 1980s U.S. crowd. It was all back and forth. There were no heels. There were no baby faces. It was all action. Mike Jackson compared... God bless these crew. And they weren't bad. Mike Jackson was like Okada at his peak compared to the rest of these guys. They did a fun little tag he match. And Thompson, is. Well, he's, he's always great, but uh, Thompson won with a power slam. The, the other great part was as, as they're going over, we, we talk about how these guys are jobbers every week. They were not jobbers in this match. I'm not just saying that because they won, or some of them won, but the way the announcers were putting these guys over, these men were carpenters. They built the business. <laughs> and Ross and Shivani are putting them over like heroes. We saw that promo where Lex talked about how Flair flies and he flies. Not these guys. These guys drive, buddy. It was awesome. The spam slam of the week is the Road Warriors hitting a doomsday device. I swear to God, they've done this one as the spam slam of the week before. Probably 50 times. Probably. Uh, Jim Ross interviews. How ironic. I'm in Hawaii. There's spam everywhere here. There is spam everywhere. Yeah, I went on a hike and, like, there's just cans of spam laying all over the place. Spam is very popular in Hawaii. So, yes, Jim Ross interviews Ric Flair. The only thing really of note here is that I was trying to try figure out what color Flair's suit was because it wasn't red, it wasn't pink. I, th- I think the best I could do was rose. It was a rose-colored suit. So he's tired of Lex. He's tired of Lex's name. He's tired of hearing morons cheer for Lex. And this, this next shot Lex gets could be his last shot. But that's about all he had to say. He says, it's your last opportunity. It's been signed, sealed, and delivered. I was like, no, it hasn't. It's been signed and sealed. It has yet to be delivered. It's definitely not delivered. Uh, they, they have said they've signed it, but have not said where or when it's going to be. There's, or, quite frankly, if it's sealed. We don't know that either. I suppose that's true. So it's only been signed. Yes, that's all we can confirm. All right, then... Oh, allow me, Vinny, please. Oh, well, I'll have a lot to say, too, but it's your show, after all. Chris Champion and Don Valentine. <laughs> I can't even say his name. I just want to... You know what? Don't. Don't say... <laughs> he doesn't deserve a name. This guy. So, Champion's out there, and Jim Ross says, Chris Champion has alerted us. He has a very special surprise coming up tonight. I'm like, man, what could this fucking special surprise be? I can't wait. So he gets in there, and he throws a... <laughs> Okay, so what happens is he throws a jumping sidekick and Don Valentine falls down. Now, 
Don Valentine is running towards the ropes at a certain speed, okay? Chris Champion is expecting him to bounce off the ropes and return towards him at the same speed. <laughs> Critical, yes. <laughs> yes. So he has to time his jumping sidekick. So he whips him into the ropes, and he leaps in the air, and he extends his leg, and this fucker, this fucking Don Valentine, I'm going to say his name, he slows down. And so the kick looks like shit, and Chris Champion falls on his ass. Don Valentine also falls down. So then, Champion is with a chop. And you can see Champion's lips. He very loudly says, stand up, because he's going to give him another fucking kick. Now this time, he's not going to throw him off the ropes. He's not going to try to time a jumping kick as a man is running off the ropes. No, he's going to have him stand up, don't fucking move, and I'm going to throw a side kick. And he throws a side kick, and this asshole fucking backs up and so champion whiffs this fucking sidekick and this time don valentine does not go down he just fucking backs up and stands there champion's like you son of a bitch and so now it's time to just finish this okay we learn or at least i learn what the special surprise that Chris Champion has promised actually is. Chris Champion stands there, and he begins to lift his arms in the air, and he begins to lift one knee up into the air, and he begins standing there on one leg in preparation for the Karate Kid crane kick. Yes. Not one announcer has any fucking idea what he's doing. He stands there on one leg, and by the way, By the way, I never realized how hard the crane kick was. (laughs) I never realized how hard it was to stand on one fucking leg. He's on one leg. Keep in mind, fucking, who was the fucking guy that played the Karate Kid? Ralph Macchio? Ralph Macchio. Who's the old old guy? What was his name? Pat Morita. Pat Morita. Pat Morita could fucking stand on a, a, a... fucking stump sticking out of the fucking water and not fall off okay he was an old guy who never even did martial arts this fucking guy can't even stand in the middle of the ring on one leg so he's wobbling back and forth he looks like the the fucking the 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 windy suspension bridge that i walked over today he can barely stand but god damn it he's gonna hit his move and he leaps in the air and he kicks don valentine right in the fucking jaw Don Valentine falls down to his death. He gets the pin, and you've never seen a man so angry to have won a squash match as Chris Champion. He's furious, and I can't blame him. He made his big comeback, and he could not have looked worse. Like, if the NWA board was thinking, that's Chris Champion, you know what? What the fuck? Let's make him world champion. He's going to beat Flair. He'll have for 25 days. And Luger's going to beat him. And then Starcade will do Luger and Flair. He'll finally face off for that title. Flair's challenger. If they'd come up with a fucking idea like that, and then they watch this match, it'd be like, match is canceled. Champion ain't getting the title. He looks like shit. And it wasn't his fault. It was his fault in the sense that he tried too much with this shithead. But it was not all his fault. The too much that he tried with this shithead was very basic stuff that if you're going, if you can't do this, you should not be on television. I watched this entire match from start to finish nonstop. I pressed pause. I sat back and thought for a while. I rewound it. I watched the entire match start to finish nonstop a second time. I just let it all sink in. I went back, I made a series of screenshots and GIFs recapping this. This is a two-minute match (laughs) that I devoted like an hour of my life to. I cannot believe my eyes. Okay, I I, I know I am prone to hyperbole, 
and I know I exaggerate sometimes. <laughs> okay, listen, listen to me, Brian. Don Valentine is the worst professional wrestler I have ever seen. And I don't limit that to, to national TV or major shows. I include that to guys who showed up to Tim Flower School to train for one time and quit halfway through and never returned. I once watched a guy in a conditioning drill. The drill was do a crisscross. When Tim shouts your name, you drop down. The other guy runs over you, and you get up and you keep on running. And you take turns doing this. I once witnessed with my own eyes in the middle of the drill, one of the guys threw on the brakes, threw his hands in the air, walked out of the building, and never returned. Okay? Yes. That guy was a better wrestler than Don Valentine. Don Valentine often appeared to me a, con a, 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 a consistent effort to sabotage his own shitty squash match. When he got the very first one, the, the very first thing Champion does is chop him. And Valentine's bump for this chop is to, like, sit down and then put his hand on the mat. Right? So then, Champion only did, like, six things in this entire two minutes, but I remember them all vividly because I watched them so much. Champion goes to whip him in for the for I I think it may have even been supposed to be a sidekick, but because it got fucked up, it or it may have been, it was supposed to be a drop kick, but because it got fucked up and Champion was trying to levitate, one foot came down <laughs> and the other came up. So I, I watched as Donald Valentine was pushed into the ropes. He didn't know how to go backwards in the ropes. He didn't know how to go forwards into the ropes. He certainly didn't know how to come off the ropes. He didn't know how to take the drop kick. So this looks horrible. At this point, the fact I, I somebody I forget who it was somebody once like, did something very similar to Road Warrior Hawk. They stopped running on a drop kick, so Hawk fell on his ass like a geek, and Hawk beat the fuck out of them. Because that's what you do when they fuck something up, and you look bad as, as a result. You have to make it's your job to make yourself look good and beat the fuck out of them. Champion didn't. Chris Champion must be the most patient man in the world, as this guy repeatedly, over and over. Either, ref either didn't know how to sell something, or just outright refused and made Champion look like the biggest goof over and over and over again. By the end of me sharing my thoughts with the world about how Don Valentine was the worst wrestler I'd ever seen, I provided evidence over and over for how he fucked up everything. Lance Storm, a Canadian man, an entire country known for their patience and kindness, Talked about how he didn't understand why Chris Champion wasn't just beating the shit out of this guy. Hurricane Helms, who has been on Lord knows how many shows across the country, across the world, the, the worst of the worst he's seen, uh, it, it, you know, in his rise to the top and his, his journeys around the world since, he simply said, this was brutal. So by the end, it's two minutes in, and, 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 and oh, I didn't even mention the other shop. Don Valentine gets whipped into the ropes. And as he's coming off the ropes, Chris Champion throws a chop at him. Do you remember, Brian, when I first made my attempt to become a pro wrestler, and we would go to that empty warehouse at night in Tacoma with holes in the, in the walls, holes in the brick walls in this warehouse. But there, God damn it, there's a ring there. So that's where we would go to train as best I could. And I would get whipped into the ropes, and I'd come off, and you or Matt Farmer or Nikki Six or whoever was there would throw a chop, and I would, I would fall, my, my back would go down, but instead of throwing my feet in the air, my feet would just keep running. <laughs> I vaguely remember like, this. Yeah, okay, that is exactly what Don Valentine did in this. The, he took a chop like I did when I started it. <laughs> when you were at your worst. At my very worst. So the point is, this guy is on TV doing something that I spent six months of my life taking chop after chop after chop, getting beaten and beaten and beaten, busting my ass to avoid doing before they would put me in front of a crowd in county fairs with a dozen people watching. Don Valentine's on national goddamn TV taking chops like this. So after two minutes of the worst wrestling I have ever, ever, ever seen with my eyeballs, Chris Champion, he has a surprise. He can't not do the crane kick, right? He can't suddenly say, fuck this, I'm just going to small package this guy and go home. He has to deliver the surprise that has been teased. He has to do the crane kick. 
So he's standing there on one foot, and I can't blame him for wobbling back and forth because he's probably scared shitless about what's going to happen now. And he's thinking, if I don't kick this guy, he probably won't sell this either. <laughs> so Tom Valentine gets up, and he slowly turns around, and Chris Champion has no choice. It's not his fault. He does what he has to do. He kicks this motherfucker right in the fucking jaw. <laughs> Valentine's head whips back. Oh, he sells this one. He sells this like a gunshot. Chris Champion looks to the announcers. He cannot believe what he has just been through. He makes the cover, and he pins him. I was ruined after this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame my, you. My life was gone astray. I didn't know what was going on. I had I, like I did not take a walk, but I had to turn the show off for a while. I could not believe this. Like I, I needed a twenty minute break to come back. Now I'm happy I did because there was more to come. But my God in heaven, do you realize, Brian? We've been watching like some shitty Saturday Night Jobbers like five years. Nothing comes close to Don Valentine. Nope. D- Dale Laparouse on his worst day can work circles around Don Valentine. J.C. Wild, we said some terrible things about you. We apologize. You are much better than Don Valentine. A new man to set the standard here on this program. I don't know. We, 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 we have to stop reviewing the show, Brian. We will never reach these depths <laughs> no, again. No, we thought that about J.C. Wild, Vinny. The worst could still be yet to come. No, this was absolute zero. This was <laughs> it, man. <laughs> we'll find out. The bottom. The bottom of the barrel. Now, then we get to something great. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever seen two segments back-to-back so horrible and so awesome. Jim Cornette and Bobby Eaton come out for a promo. And Jim Cornette explains Stan Lane is not here this week because he was sick last week. He got sick last week. He met so many nurses. He's busy this week. He'll be busy for four more days. So he talks about the Midnight Express and the Four Horsemen. He says, the four horsemen have a different lifestyle. They like to ride in limousines. I know that because they rent them for my mom. The four horsemen like to go drinking. I know that because Bobby Eaton has helped Arn Anderson stumble home. And they like to chase ladies. I know that because I've seen Tully Blanchard get down on his hands and knees and beg Stan Lane for just one phone number. Now, J.J. Dillon, I know he's a great manager. He used to be a great wrestler, too, in his little boots and his wool trunks. And he, like, as he's about to say this, it's Shivani, I think, pulls the bike back. He, he says wool trunks first. So the wool trunks were a thing back in the day. And Cornette says, you're a great manager, J.D. Dillon, but I'm what's happening today. Now, the four horsemen, he, he actually said the four horsemen, four horsemen aren't here today. And the reason is they got lost. They thought they were reading a road map. They were reading J.J. Dillon's varicose veins. <laughs> now, Bobby Eaton, he's going to wrestle this doughboy. And at this point, he points at the ring, and Bobby Eaton looks at what he's pointing at. But we don't see the ring. We just see the two of them. And he, Cornette keeps on ranting about this doughboy. Do boy, and as he's ranting, Bobby Eaton looks at the ring, and Bobby Eaton never shows any emotion on these shows, ever. But he looks at the doughboy he's going to wrestle, and about three seconds go by, and Eaton's eyes light up, and he just says, really? So we get beautiful Bobby versus Gary Phelps. Who was, in fact, a doughboy. No one will ever confuse Bobby Eaton with Rick Rude, for example, but look at Gary Phelps, man. That's bad, he dude. Was, he was a doughboy. But hey, there's there's not much to say about this match, thing for one thing. Sometimes Bobby Eaton will go in there and he'll try and actually have a good match with one of these jobbers. He was not even bothering today. He probably saw no. the previous match and was like, fuck it, I'm just going to go home. He goes in there, he does a quick match. The only notable thing about this match is that he went up top, and he won with the bombs away knee drop. Yes. He never does that move. He he does a rocket launcher. He does the big splash. Does the leg drop. Leg drop. Yep, the Alabama jam. He won with a top rope knee drop. And I think that the reason that he used that move was a tribute to Bruiser Brody, who'd been murdered two weeks earlier. Because oh, that shit. was Brody's finish. Yeah. Nobody mentioned it. Nobody said a word. But I, I watched the finish, and I think that's what that was. So two more things to say about this finish. First of all, as he's about to jump, you can see there's a cable cl- close to him. 
And Cornyn actually says, I hope Bobby doesn't hang himself because that cable is only 22 feet above the ring. So then Bobby jumps, and on the replay, his hair actually did brush against this cable. <laughs> he, he made something tra- tragic. Almost did happen here. But it didn't. He hits the knee drop. He bends over and adjusts Phelps trunks <laughs> because they'd slipped a bit. He wins with a foot on the chest, and he leaves. So there you go. Now then. Now then. J.J. Dillon's on camera. The only guy in the Four Horsemen who showed up. Now, no one mentioned this, but we often see guys in the show, and they have recently gigged. So they'll have like a, a clear red line on their forehead or a fresh bandage. I don't know what happened to J.J., because no one talked about it. It appeared that he had tried to gig himself with sandpaper. There was... There, there was a threshing of his face that had been done, like a field. No one brought it up, but there it was. So he cuts a promo about how he and Cornette have always respected each other, and he's always thought of Cornette as a friend. One time he said, I even visited the Cornettes at their mansion. But it was strange. We were drinking champagne out of these funny little glasses, out of these funny little straws, because Mama thinks that's cute. And right there... Right there, J.J. Dillon crossed the line. Because Jim Cornette is, in fact, a mama's boy. And when you talk about a mama's boy's mama, he's going to get pissed. So Cornette comes out to defend mama. He says, those funny little glasses were Zulu glasses, which you know, but the only thing you drink is Ripple and Boone's Farm, you Foster Brooks lookalike. I don't know what half these references are anymore. I'm sure they're bad. Dylan does a rebuttal. As he's talking, Cornette is like looking at his watch, bored out of his mind with everything JJ has to say. J- Dylan says, every time we pull up in a limo, it eats your heart out because you arrive in a taxi cab. And every night when we're in that same locker room, you see Tully Blanchard and, Ar- and Arnold Anderson pack their bags. The last thing they pack is those world tag team championship belts that puts them on, they put them on top of their bags and you can't stand it. And Cornette says, well, when we beat you guys, when we take your belts, don't worry. You can still put them in that special case. You can carry them around for us. And Dylan warns him, next time when that mismatch finally happens, you should leave that tennis racket at home. And Cornette says, well, I think I'll bring that tennis racket because I can't help but notice, JJ. You've got a habit of losing your shoes at key points in matches. You'll need, it to, uh, you'll need the tennis racket as a shoehorn to dig those shoes out of your ears after the Midnight Express stick them in there. This is it, man. It's on. These guys do not like each other. They're pissed. It started off professional. It is now personal. These teams are going to fight. This was awesome. Uh, Alperez beat Rick Allen. It was what it was. Then we got the real good stuff on the show. This was my favorite promo on the whole show. Even more so than the ones you just recap. Gary Hart and Al Perez. Well, it's all Gary Hart, of course. No, Gary Hart, yes. So he cuts his promo and the first thing he says is, if Jim Cornette ever talked to me the way that he talked to J.J. Dillon, I'd take his tennis racket, I'd shove it down his throat. Cornette's a two-bit creep. I'd spit in his face, and Cornette better never get in my face. So then, he cuts his promo about Dusty Rhodes. Correct me if I'm wrong here. He says... Dusty's father beat two men to death with his bare hands in the heel country, and he can't even, Dusty can no longer show his face in Austin, Texas. That's why he had to move to Allen, Texas. What? That's exactly what he said. That's news to me. Dusty Rhodes was born in Austin, had to move to Allen because his father beat two men to death with his bare hands in the hill country. Well, the hill, I think it's the heel country. Yes. So then Sullivan shows up. He puts over Al Perez. Sullivan just walks out. <laughs> he shakes hands and he says something about like Mr. Hart. And and Hart as cal- his delivery was so perfect. You can call me Gary. Yes. He awesome. says that Al Perez will be a future heavyweight champion of the world. That's not true. That never happened. Well, no, I did not. He says he's managed by the greatest manager of all time, Mr. Hart. That's when Hart says you can call me Gary. And Sullivan says the two of us can get rid of Dusty. And Gary says, I think we need to do in Texas, his own state. The only thing worse than one Texan is two Texans, especially when they're ugly. And he buries him, and he turns and he says, thank you very much for your time, Jim Ross. And off they go. 
He's <laughs> such a polite asshole. <laughs> he is. Also, isn't Al from Texas? I believe so, but from the good part of Texas. I guess so. I guess so. But yes, this this was also phenomenal. So, back at the arena, Bob Cottle interviews Dusty Rhodes, who has his buzzed his hair. He basically has the Eminem haircut at this point. And Dusty begins to list all the talent on the all, all the baby faces. Says his main man now stands with Sting. He stands with Nikita Koloff. He stands with Dr. Death. He stands with the Road Warriors. The outlaw Dick Murdoch is my man, baby. And he calls out Gary Hart's men, calls it the Varsity Club, the Midnight Express, the Horseman. He promises pain, blues, and agony. We then get Dick Murdoch versus a guy. The guy was Trent Knight, and it is a squash match from an arena somewhere. And Trent Knight... Well, first off, what happens is Dick Murdoch, who is now a babyface, and Dusty Rhodes, who is a babyface, double team this poor fucking jobber, and they beat his ass. They're double teaming him outside. They're beating the shit out of him. The ref's just standing there letting this all go on. Dick Murdoch hits a brain buster, pins poor Trent Knight. Dusty hits the ring. They kill this guy further. And I'm yes. watching this going. How in the fuck are these guys baby faces? It'd be one thing if, like, I'm trying to think of some Sullivan. Let's let's just say that it was Dick Murdoch, Kevin Sullivan. Kevin Sullivan's a dastardly heel. Everybody hates him. And they end up double teaming him outside. And then Murdoch beats him. And then they get in there and they beat the hell out of him for some sort of revenge or something. It's still dumb because it's two on one advantage baby face. But at least if the heel is like a really diabolical heel, you can kind of say, well, you know, the fans loved it. They hate the heel, whatever. Trent Knight never did anything. No. He didn't even have a bad squash. He was an innocent victim. He just got in there, and these two guys double-teamed him and bullied him like total assholes. It was the weirdest thing I ever saw. Between the new haircut, which is just, you know, it's not that, it, it, it's a change, right? Dusty changed. Then they went out and did this match. If I had just told you that Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch were united, and then you watched this, you would not assume Dick Murdoch was a babyface. You would assume Dusty turned heel. Yes. Absolutely. So then Murdoch does his promo. Uh, we talked a little bit out of a little bit about it before. It says uh, whenever they fight each other or someone else, they never ask for help. He says in Detroit, Kevin Sullivan and the Sheik got out of the line. He signed a contract to team with the Sheik, or maybe was team. I may have gotten that wrong. Team with Sullivan, I think. Did his best to win the match, but then they tried to take Dusty's eye out. And right before he's about to say something else, they cut him off and go to break. Yeah, it was weird. He's like it right in the middle weird. of ranting about someone's eye being pulled out, and they just cut away and went to break. Yeah. I guess it wasn't PG enough for TBS. May not have been. I, don't, I hadn't thought of that, but that may be it. Rip Morgan versus Bear Collie. By the way, what a great promo Dick Murdoch was. Well, like, we've talked about this before, but when I heard that Dick Murdoch turned babyface, it was like, God damn it. He was such a great heel. He cut such great heel promos. But then I remembered, before he turned heel, we said the same thing about when he was a babyface. Like, oh man, Murdoch turned heel. He was such a great babyface. He cut such great babyface promos. He just wanted to go barbecue at his house or something. He's just a good old country boy in his promos. Well, now he's back to being that again. So you can't go wrong with a Dick Murdoch promo. No, no, you cannot. The amazing thing about it, the most amazing thing is, is that his heel promos and his babyface promos, I and mean, they're very distinct, duh. But they still somehow both come off as believable, different sides of yes. the same guy. He is not like he's a different human being. He's just in a different mood. He's he's explaining it in a different way. Yes, he's just he, it, it, it's, it's a it's, different justification when he's a heel versus when he's a babyface. It is radically different, but at the same time, very authentic and believable. It's amazing. So Rip Morgan and Bear Collie. Bear Collie. Not Big Bear uh, Collie, by the way. He's no big longer bear big. Collie. He is merely Bear Collie. Maybe he's Big Bear Collie's brother. I hadn't thought of that. Maybe with a few of the holidays. Like the holiday so brothers. He, he is the guy who looks like Scott Norton. And on yes. a different week, on a different week, I would have buried him from being a terrible wrestler. But after seeing Don Valentine, he may as well have been Scott Norton here. And Morgan beat him up and pinned him with what I guess was a diving forearm. This <laughs> Morgan like the, fella. The, Morgan is the very definition of an old school stomper. 
everything yes. he does is accompanied by stomp. He he gyrates his arms all over the place. He's got the big bug eyes. He's like a con- you know what he is. He's pretending to be Luke and Butch at the same time. Basically, yes. Yeah, he's not as good, but he's kind of a guilty pleasure. I, I've seen I've seen many 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 wrestlers on this show alone, but uh, many stars who are worse than Rip Morgan. I'm yes. Like for him. He won. He basically did the the, the like the the, the uh, was Steve Austin would do like the, the middle finger elbow, the forearm across the guy's throat. Morgan basically did that off the middle rope and one. That's it. And, and I, I guess he went home early because the announcers had to flap their gums for a while to fill time, and then the show ended. A breathtaking show. <laughs> you know what? It's funny. It was like this was an absolutely nothing show that you absolutely have to watch. Yes. <laughs> like there's not a lot of shows you can say that about. I might go watch it again right now. This is a show where nothing happened. No. But if you missed it, like, you can't die. You somehow got to watch it before you go. August 6th, 1988. If you're not a customer, if you're not a subscriber to the WWE Network, get your credit card out. Go sign up right now. Yep. This justifies your one-month fee by a thousand times. Yes. <laughs> this show is a reason to be a wrestling fan. It is. Yep. So, yeah. There you go, everybody. All right, we're going to wrap it up from here. And there will be gorilla shit all over the army. So anyway, let's talk about NWA and then how great Ric Flair is. Yeah, we'll blow through this episode. This uh, the, the other thing that spawned these Ric Flair matches, besides that you wanted to watch them talk about them, is we had a lot of time because this episode of, N- of NWA World Championship Wrestling was very short. It was like 36 Thir- minutes. It was 38 minutes on the network. So and- there were 22 minutes of commercials. So was this like a 45-minute episode for some reason? Maybe. It's all, weird. All, all I know is the 38 minutes is at least 30 minutes too long. Nothing happened. It was boring. August 13th, 1988, if you want to watch it for some reason. An inauspicious start here. There is one reason to watch it, Vinny. All right. Maybe I've forgotten, but... You've forgotten? Well, okay, there's that. Thank you. <laughs> Clips of Brad Armstrong versus Al Perez. This was not worth watching. And it was funny because later in the show, they had a... I think, who came first? Al Perez? Whoever came out first. Brad Armstrong had a match first, and then Al Al Perez came out afterwards. And I totally forgot about the opening clip. It's forgettable. And I thought, motherfucker, if these two guys had a match, that's got to be like the most boring match there's ever been. And then it turns out I'd seen clips of that match 20 minutes earlier, and I'd already forgotten about it. So one of the announcers even said, Al Perez and Brad Armstrong is like looking in a mirror. Yeah. It is? Well, to... I'm not that bored when I look in the mirror. <laughs> anyway. So the announcers are, announcers are running down the show when out come Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express. And Cornette does all the talking, of course. He says he was worried the Four Horsemen would have an advantage in their upcoming tag match because of the Four Horsemen vitamins. Oh. So he raided their bags. He opened the bag of vitamins, found they were all chewable and shaped like Fred and Wilma Flintstone. He made jokes about Arn going bald, totally Blanchard being out of shape. He said Gary Hart was talking bad about him last week. Well, Gary Hart, you make Grandpa Munster look like a Playgirl centerfold. He mentioned Grandpa Munster because they were doing like the reboot of of well, Grandpa, well that too, but Grandpa Munster also had a monster movie thing Saturday mornings. I see on TBS. So. Well, he mentioned that. He mentioned Max Headroom. He talked about Gary bring Max Headroom and Frito Bandito with you. And he also had a simply irresistible reference. Yes. I think this may have been the only time in my life that Cornette was totally up on pop culture. It may have been. I guess maybe he is now, but, you know, he's he likes to talk about the old days. He was talking about the new days here in this promo. I, I think Max Headroom and Frito Bandito is a reference to Ron Garvin and Al Perez. Could be. I guess. They kind of look like him. I suppose. Ricky Morton in a singles match. Against Robert Gibson quit. Robert Gibson quit versus Lee Ramsey. It's still Ricky Morton. He's got the same music, got the bandanas, rock and roll in his tights. God, I watched this match and I thought, now I want a singles match with Ricky Morton. We had the tag team match. Sure. But man, a singles match with Ricky, he can still go. You just now figured this out? Well, yeah, I mean, in, I in knew In 2019, that, but... you realized a singles match with Ricky Morton would be good, good uh, well, and fun? Well, you know, I thought about it again after watching all those flare matches. So he took everything, hit a jumping DDT and a top rope body press for the win. And then it was time for the interview. Now, as you noted... Robert Gibson quit. So they need something to do with Ricky Morton. So he's standing there with David Crockett, and David says, Ricky, I want to ask you about your new team with Nikita Koloff. 
And I thought, okay. Rick- Hold on a second. Yeah. You thought, okay? Well, listen. Ricky Morton is teaming with Nikita Koloff. Well, think about this, though. Think about this. I know they're not they're neither doing anything. Neither guy's doing anything. And yeah. Think about this team. Ricky Morton sells forever. The crowd goes crazy. Nikita hits the ring. Is the Russian nightmare running wild? Sure, but just- you can do that with any other person besides Ricky Morton. Also true. It's just such a weird combo. Well, you get the Rock and Russia Express, which no one actually said during this match. This promo which made me sad. But David asked this question. He asked, tell me about your team with Nikita Koloff. And Ricky immediately says, I want to talk about the singles world title. That's about time Ricky Morton was the heavyweight champion of the world. And then at this point, Nikita does a run-in. Yeah. To turn the promo back around. Yes. And talk about their tag team. (laughs) I don't know if it was a... Going into business for himself, or well, what? Well, there was a lot of weird promos by Ricky since they came back. Been a lot of world pro- weird promos by Ricky. Uh, by, by the end, they were on the same page. They were going after the tag titles, and Ricky talked about what a great team they'd be. Hey, listen, I'm ready for Ricky Morton versus Ric Flair. Well, they did it a bunch I'd like of times. to see that, that feud go for about 10 years from this point fair, forward. Fair enough. We, I mean, they did a feud. Yes. It was awesome. Yes. So, anyway, yeah, Ricky and Morton and, and Nikita Koloff, you're a tag team. Koloff is there mumbling through his promo. The, the, somehow, they get worse every week. <laughs> And it was like, Ricky's gone from one guy who doesn't talk to another guy who can't talk. Maybe that's the other tie-in here. He's that have, actually is a great combination. To he's going to have to do uh, the promos comparison. for both guys again. Yes, yes. Now this, I assume... Oh, he also adds, by the way, hmm. the official team name, Vinny, is Nikita Koloff and Rick Morton. Ah. He's no longer R- little Ricky. He's Rick Morton. Rick Morton. Yes. Now, I assume this next segment is what you're talking about when you said the one thing we're watching. Are you fucking kidding me? Was there anything else on this show? They should have just shown this match for 45 minutes, <laughs> and I would have been perfectly satisfied. The Varsity Club had a trios match, taking on the three-man team of Gary Phelps, Rick Allen, and the worst professional wrestler I have ever seen, Don Valentine. So, Vinny, last week, there was another terrible jobber who I've since forgotten, but he was he was the former worst jobber of all time. But then Don Valentine came along. J.C. Wild. Might have been J.C. Wild. And do you remember? J.C. Wild had an absolutely horrific squash match, or whatever it was. I can't even call it a match. But anyway, the very next week, Kevin Sullivan got a match with J.C. Wild. That's true. And last week, Don Valentine was fucking terrible. And lo and fucking behold... They put him in the ring. Kevin Sullivan and the Varsity Club get to do the match with Don Valentine. Did... Rick Allen tag in one time in this match. Here's how it went. Don Valentine started. They tagged in. Gary Phelps and did some stuff with him. Yep. Rick Allen tagged in, and Steiner just grabbed him and said, tag in Valentine again. Yes. That was the extent of Rick Allen's action in this match. So they come down to the ring, and Sullivan's coming down, and I just knew he was targeting Don Valentine. I just knew it. And if you watch him, he gets in the ring, and he's got a smile on his face, And he whispers something to Gary Hart. (laughs) And the bell rings, and he goes right after Don Valentine. Yes. And he beats the shit out of him. He does. He chops the fuck out of him. He slaps him across the face. He throws him outside and gives him a vicious beating on the cement. The boots, he's throwing to the back of Don Valentine's head on the floor. As his head is on the floor. On the floor. (laughs) So there's nowhere for his head to go but into the cement. Yes. Then he tags in... Rick Steiner. Rick Steiner. And I thought, now this guy's going to die. But they actually let him tag in Gary Phelps. Well, they did, but first he punched him right in the face. Sure. But once Gary Phelps gets in, mm-hmm. like, Kevin Sullivan chops him, but he doesn't beat the hell out of him. No. He he he, res- wor- he works snug. He, he respects the man enough to just, like, do a squash match with the guy. Yes. And then he's like, get that fucking guy back in here. Mm-hmm. And they bring... This this Don Valentine back in, and Sullivan fucking does four straight double foot stomps, okay? <laughs> now listen. Okay. If I'm going to give you, for example, a big splash off the top. Yes. Or a senton. Mm-hmm. Or I did the, the Eddie Guerrero senton into the ring last night. Yes. Okay. If the guy's arms are out like this... You know, you kick the guy's arms in. He should be protecting his ribs. Yes. Okay. So, when you're going to take a double foot stomp, like, don't put your fucking hands on your stomach. He's going to step on them. This idiot puts his hands on his stomach. And Sullivan, there's zero verbal or physical attempt to have the guy move his hands. 
So he jumps in the fucking hair and double foot stomps the guy. He stumps his fucking fingers into his guts. Yeah. Four times. Over and over. Okay, the guy's fingers have got to be broken. And his innards just bamboozled. Squash this guy with four double foot stumps. He did literally squash him. Yep. And then he tags in Rick Steiner. Rick Steiner grabs this guy, and one of his arms is trapped. So I figure, well, he's going to take him up into the side, and he trapped his arm, so the guy doesn't put his fucking arm down and break his arm. Doing the belly belly, belly to belly. Yes. Easy for me to say. He does not take him to the side. He traps his arm. He goes straight fucking up into the air, straight fucking down on the guy's head, and he twists at the very last second. It is the shootest shoot belly to belly you've ever seen in your entire life. He drops this guy right on his head. The guy is dead. And he pins him. Okay, now listen. Don Valentine's horrible. It's the fucking worst wrestler I may have ever seen. Even I felt bad for this guy in this match. (laughs) He's just a guy that he wants to be in the business, and he's training somewhere, and he's just trying to get a break, and he got brought to TV to do some matches with the stars. And they tried... They tried to kill him in this match. Do you understand? It, it started out with just, you know, we're going to stiff him. But then they're like stomping on his head on the cement and four double foot stomps to his guts and a shoot fucking spike overhead belly to belly suplex. They tried to kill this guy. That wasn't right. I felt bad for the guy. But if you want to see a dude get massacred on television and presumably he lived, we would have heard about it. I don't know if he ever wrestled again. I wouldn't. But if you if, if that's what you like out of your wrestling, have I got the match for you? <laughs> and I do. Well, there you go. <laughs> I really do. So, yes, Kevin Sullivan is stiff with these jobbers every single week. Always to beat the hell out of him. Rick Steiner is not always stiff, but when he is stiff, he's absolutely horrifying. The scariest guy in the company. And Rotunda is not nearly... He, he, he's much, much, much lighter than these guys, but when he has to throw a guy over, he has his amateur background. So, between the three of them... Every single thing they did to Don Valentine was something that he ha- he absolutely had to sell if it was a strike, or he had to go over if it was a suplex. Are we sure that we know that Don Valentine knew that it was fake? Uh, this was not because he by the end of this, this was not. he went up he he went up for nothing. Yeah, I mean, he went up all right. There was a <laughs> oh, suplex. he's going over. There was a rotunda suplex at one point. Yes, I, I, I can't remember what. I think it was just a vertical. This is a uh, butterfly double arm suplex. Yeah, it was a butterfly, mm-hmm. and he starts to go, and the guy doesn't go up. Yeah, and so he just drops low, and his <laughs> hips go out, you, and he throws his head back, and he, he managed to get this fucking guy over. I'm not sure this guy knew that it was fake. I think he went in there, and it was a shoot. That actually would explain a lot. It would explain a lot, especially last week. But, uh, yeah. And, man, after after he got the first beating and they allow him to tag out, if you watch it, they throw his ass through the middle rope and he's on the apron and they start to work with Gary Phelps and it's a long time before Don Valentine gets back to his feet. <laughs> and I don't think he was selling. Because it was right after he got... he didn't his, sell anything. His head was fucking stomped into the cement. Yeah. He was struggling to get back to his feet. No, he didn't sell anything. And yes, the, the finish, finishing move, I described it as a belly-to-belly brain buster. This is what it was. This is not a suplex. He dropped him on his head. So yes, uh, the lesson here is, if you have a guy who absolutely, totally sucks and can't, can't, can't do a goddamn thing, just beat the hell out of him. Lex comes out for a promo. Problem solved. I, it solved my problem, that's for sure. Lex Luger promo wasn't very good. They had bust in some guys from the, or some children from the boys club in South Carolina, and maybe that's why. But there was a lot of uh, Ric Flair fans in the crowd. Eventually, uh, Luger's rambling on. Nobody cares. He tears off his shirt. The girls cheer. The boys boo. That's about it. I got nothing out of this. Yeah, there was really nothing. A little bit of uh, a little bit of booing for him, and yeah, nothing. Just nothing happening. Promo. Brad Armstrong versus Dave Spearman. A nothing happened in match. The highlight of this match was Dave Spearman almost forgot he was booked. Like the graphics are on the screen and Brad's waiting for him and Spearman comes sprinting out to be in this <laughs> yeah, match. Yeah, they're actually they put the, the graphic on the screen as he's sprinting to the ring. Yeah. So there are some arm draw arm drags. Or arm drags, I don't know. And Brad dodges an elbow, he hits his leg sweep and he wins. Paul Jones cuts a promo with the Russian assassin. And what I, I guess you'd call this oh, newsworthy. God. 
All I know is he starts out, and I think that he wants to say that I promised that I would run... No, what the fuck was he even trying to say? He he ends up talking about how they haven't run out the Road Warriors. The Road Warriors yet. are still around. But he started talking about running off the powers of pain. Well, it, but he started talking about the powers of pain, but he finished the sentence talking about Legion of Doom, and he never finished what he was talking about. This is Paul Jones we're talking about here, so... <laughs> This is not a surprise. Pow- he he has changed, taken the, the 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 term "powers of pain." The powers of pain were his tag team, but they're gone now. So now he refers to himself as the power of pain. I see. Yes. Now, there's a reason he should not have done this, and you've just described why because it's very confusing. But regardless, yes, he had promised the Road Warriors and Paul Ellering would be gone. They are still around. He must admit this means there's a problem in his camp. So he looked around. He looked at his big Russian. Never called him the Russian assassin, just his big Russian. Probably forgot his name. This man is everything Ivan promised and more. So he looked at Ivan Koloff, a man who had been a trusted friend for many, many years, but Ivan had let him down lately. And he told, told Ivan it's time to shape up or ship out. So he, he tells Ivan Koloff to shape up or ship out, yeah. which leads to Ivan Koloff crying, big we- horse tears coming out of his eyes. Weeping. Yes. And Ivan admitted he was lacking, but he would soon be a new man. He would meet Paul Jones' expectations. And Jones says, I want to eliminate the Warriors. I want victims, not victories. That's a good line. Actually, yes. I'm going to steal that. He promises the Road Road Warriors will be gone. That is what's happening in my matches. It actually is, yes. I've gotten a lot of victims, but no victories. Few, few victories. I did chop the shit out of that guy last night. (laughs) Oh, there you go then. Al Perez beat Max MacGyver with a toehold. Boring. Gary Hart promo. Okay, this was awesome. This was the other good thing on I the show. I forgot about this. This was incredible. This was one of those old school heel promos where you're walking the line. <laughs> he was walking the line here. Well, he even acknowledged it at one point. So he's out there with Al Perez, and the Texas Outlaws have reunited. So he says, any partner I find to put with Al Perez, they will beat the Texas Outlaw- Outlaws. He says... Dusty Murdoch or Dusty, Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch are a tag team. Dickie Murdoch. Dickie Murdoch once was dancing with Dusty's sister. And he said, now, Dusty's sister is an ugly, ugly woman. She has a butch haircut, he says. It's so butch, she might be... Anyway. Yes. <laughs> Just something you didn't hear often in the 1980s. Said Murdoch always carried a feed bag with him for his horses, and he put that feed bag over her head. Yes. Dancing with her. Says there's a lot of ugly women in Texas. And if you're in Texas right now and you're mad at me, look at your wife, look at your daughter, you'll know I'm telling the truth. But none of your women are as ugly as Dusty Rhodes' sister. And somewhere in here, he talked about how he crossed all lines, and if Dusty was any kind of real man, he'd come fight him right now. He also buried his mother. I forget what he said about Dusty's mother. Something about uh, her hair dye job or something is something there's something a lot to keep track of uh, among the thousands and thousands of texan women that gary so what hart we know about something. dusty's family as a result of gary hart is that dusty has a sister who is hideously ugly with a butch haircut and dickie murdoch loves to dance with her but he has to put a feed bag on her head first because she's so ugly yes dusty's dad died face down in a ditch if i recall correctly. he said that but all, but uh first he had but he was beat- also wanted and he had to be run out of the he had beaten two men to death with his bare hands yes before dying in the ditch yes and as a drunk, was he a drunk? I forget if he I, had he a must drunk. must have been. Yeah. It's a shame Gary's gone, because Gary Hart writing a book about the Dusty Rhodes family would be awesome. And this is already very compelling. It is. I've learned a lot about I, the, want, I want more about Dusty's relatives. The Dusty clan. Yes. The Rhodeses. I also love that he specified it was a feed bag. Yeah, not just a burlap sack. Not just a paper sack or anything like that. I mean, it's a feed bag. Feed bag. Barry Windham versus Curtis Thompson. The most notable thing about the match itself is that Barry's out there in tie-dye pink trunks. Because by using the term feed bag, like animals yeah. eat out of a feed bag. Yes. So using that on his sister, she's she's so ugly, she's like an animal. If you just say a paper bag, it's just like you put your groceries in there. You know what I'm saying? I see. It's more derogatory to call uh, use it a, the feed bag reference. Right. So as Barry is doing this match, Tully and Arn are doing their own live inset promo running down the Midnight Express. It wasn't very good. Arn says something... Are you, what are you talking about? Well, Their Arn said promo is incredible. Arn said he has a bad rep in Charlotte for dragging an ugly broad around. Yes. Is that Bobby? Yes. I he, see. He buries Bobby Eaton. Okay, and he it, says it, he it went looks, over my head. He said Bobby Eaton looks like an ugly broad, may not have any male hormones. As soon as he says that, totally fucking loses it. Well, that line was about Cornette. 
I see. Cornette had no male, no male hormones. Eden, yes. he says, has too many tendencies to chase women. So now they're suggesting that he's gay. Ah, I see. So if you're a gay or lesbian in the 80s, I don't know if you're aware of this, that's a very derogatory term. It was, and they're pushing that envelope n- here. Not used show. complimentary on the show. No. Now. Uh, I did catch when they said Stan spends too much time chasing women and not enough time training. He'll never be a world champion. Told him to change your lifestyle, do your own talking because you do your own fighting. And Tully just said that they knew a lot of teams were worried about whether Jim Cornette would be out there cheating or not. It didn't matter to them if Cornette's there or not. They were going to win either way. And Barry won with a claw. Then we get a Barry Windham, J.J. Dillon promo. J.J. says it's quiet out there because Sting is not there this week. And Sting is not there because he's afraid of the claw. And Windham says, you know, a lot of people are afraid of the claw, but I am more than just the iron claw. I don't need the claw to win. I know every hold, every counter. I just use the claw because it's my ace in the hole. He said, when he put his opponents in the claw hold, they looked up and said, and this is a quote, Please, Barry, let go of my head. Let go of my face. It hurts too bad. <laughs> That's what they should say. Claw's a very dangerous hole. And you should ask nicely for him to let go. Please, yes. Barry, let go of my head. Let yes, go of my there's face. There's a lot of pressure points in the skull. There's a lot of attachments to different things in your body. You squeeze those, mm-hmm. things go wrong. They do, they do. Bet you didn't know that. That's how the claw works. Flair promo with the rest of the horsemen. The only line look of up this... craniopathy. All right. If you look up craniopathy, the opposite of craniopathy is the claw. Craniosacral therapy. It's yeah, it's kind of like that, but it's the opposite of that. So you 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 heal the man by pushing on his head, but you if you push on his head violently, you're going to make the man ill. Craniopathy. Any any disease of the skull. Metabolic craniopathy. This is from Medical Dictionary, thefreedictionary.com. A condition characterized by lesions of the calvaria with multiple metabolic changes and by headache, obesity, and visual disorders. How will craniopathy help me? Let's see what it says here. Let's see. There's a lot of stuff here. Uh, the sacrum is the foundation of the spine. The sacrum is often called the tailbone, although that's not exactly correct. Occipital, I wonder if Gorilla Monsoon wrote this, <laughs> means related to or associated with the occiput, which is the back of the head. So, this technique is a method of normalizing the relationship between the foundation of the spine and the top of the spine. It is this relationship and how these two bones get along with one another that has been proven to be so important in the normal functioning of the brain and spinal cord. So if you fuck with a guy's head with the claw, you're going to undo all of that. Yeah, yeah. His limbs could fall off. Yeah, his, uh, the uh, terrychiropracticboulder.com says craniopathy is the incredible solution to, quote, normal, unquote, problems. Well, yeah, it is. I guess so. And uh, there's a link here for a free 30-minute, or for a friend, and get a free 30-minute massage. Mm. Anyway, Flair's promo, the only line, he's running down Dusty and the Road Warriors and Dr. Death and Sting and all the good guys, and he says, they have to go out back and pull their own chain. A lot of line pushing on this episode. I'll say. And he really just said, we're the best. Uh, if you don't like it, learn to love it, whatever he said. It was This is not a nothing Flair promo, and there's not many of those. The Fantastics versus Brad and Britt Holiday. Yes, they got to be a tag team this week against another they team. Did. They suck. They're horrible. They were beaten quickly the by the small, Fantastics. The small one in particular is useless. All you need to know about this one, this match is that at one point, they whipped the smaller Holiday into the corners, and he missed. Yeah, it sucks when that happens. The Fantastics won with a standing rocket launcher. The show immediately ended a huge waste of time. Yeah, it literally was just off the air immediately when that happened. Mm-hmm. It was very much a waste of time, but not if you really want to see that squash match. If you want to see a man die. And you actually should watch the Gary Hart promo. If you want to see how a promo's cut. <laughs> Gary Hart was awesome. He's incredible. Remember the first day he showed up and he was just like there? I was like, it's just there. Just basic, nothing happened in promo. This was like for a couple of months. Then all of a sudden he just turned it on. And he's, he's in some ways he's better than Flair. In he's, some ways. He's just incredible. So we watched these two Ric Flair matches. We sure did. Ric Flair versus Sting from WCW Monday Night Show, April 12th, 1999. So... It remains true, if you've seen one uh, Sting and Flair match, you've seen them all, but 
You should still see them all because they're all awesome. Well, they're all a little bit different. I mean, there were some spots in here I don't remember from every single match. Like when Flair goes for the the big knee drop, but Sting catches his leg and puts him in the figure four. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because that was a different one because Flair wanted to do that spot, catch my knee, and then put a figure four on. But Sting, having wrestled Flair seven million other times, wasn't used to a new spot. So what actually happened was Flair went up for the knee drop thinking Sting would catch it, and then Sting didn't catch it, and so Flair actually dropped his knee on Sting's head. So what uh, what date was this again? April 12th, 1999. April 12, 1999. Now, I All thought right. at first, I couldn't imagine Ric Flair would actually st- stiff someone with a knee drop. I must be confused. And then realized, no, Flair just removed the entire top layer of Sting's face paint. Oh. So he actually hit him with his damn knee. But it was probably Sting's fault. He was supposed to catch it, but he did not. Then immediately Flair tried it again, and Sting caught it and hooked the figure four. Uh, there are a lot of press slams, a lot of drop kicks, sunset flip with the trunks pulled down. A lot of chops, a lot of chop no-selling. The part where Flair briefly took over on the outside and threw Sting in and then snuck up on him and threw a chop block. Yes. That was gold. Arn cheating a lot. Nut shots all over the place. The announcers did sound terribly bored. I will say that. What are you talking about? I thought they were great on this show. I thought Have you been watching Nitro? This was back when, when these two guys were having the time of their lives. Hmm. Tony was having a great time. Bobby was having a great time. It was the spring of of uh, 1999, and so they were on fire. They were on fire. And they were about to. They were about to go. Actually, no. This was was this 99. 99. Oh no, they were already on the way down. Spring of uh, uh, whatever that they were on fire, but uh, 98. But yeah, I thought I thought the announcers were still having a lot of fun here. So Arn's cheating, uh, Arn's cheating like crazy. The place is going crazy for all this cheating. Randy Savage appears. Leaves out Arn. Leaves. And then Flair goes for a suplex, which has already failed once. And Sting reverses it into the death drop and makes a cover. And Charles Robinson, the crooked heel ref, does not want to count, but ultimately has no choice because Ric Flair is dead. And after a long delay, he drops and counts three, and Sting wins. And then for good measure, Arn attacks Sting, and Sting puts him in the scorpion as well. You know what's weird? Because every is, once in a while, WCW knew what they were doing and knew how to make fans happy. I uh, I couldn't figure out why. Like, why do we not review this, or why do I why do I not remember this match? And I'm looking through my notes here. The only thing I remembered about this was that this is the area where Sting was wearing white spats on his boots. Yeah, very strange looking. There's a reason he stopped. Well, I mean, one of the the one of the deals with this match was. The announcers talk about how Sting had been mostly in the rafters lately. So he had not been wrestling regularly. And, I mean, if you watch it, Flair carried him for 20 minutes. Yeah. All the way through this match. And he made it all the way through. So that was uh, that was quite the performance by Flair. Why can't I find this review? What's the date again? April 12th, 1999. April 12, 1999. Am I looking at August? That's August. There we go. So, April 9, you say. This must be it. It's April 10, I wrote this. You know what's funny is I type in Sting White Spats, and nothing Sting-related comes up, but a lot of uh, uh, Fight Factory links come up, including your tights. My tights? <laughs> the, the red ones you wear? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Or something, uh, very close to it, anyway. All right, here we go. Flair versus Sting. Okay, where are you looking? My own notes. Oh, okay. It was a very good match and a lot of fun. Place was going nuts. Arn hit the apron. I just, I literally just recapped it. All I wrote was, was a very good match and a lot of fun. What was I doing that day? Was I not paying attention? I don't know what to tell you, man. This match was unbelievable. I loved this match. Do you actually have all your notes saved on your computer? Or you yeah, t- I can, and they're searchable, too. Impressive, wow. I, I can find anything, dude. I'm I delete, a professional. I delete mine every week. Oh, uh, no. I'm yeah. a pro. It's Google Docs. Mm. Then it's all saved forever. I see. Yeah, you know how much space I've got in Google Docs? How much space do you have in Google Docs? You, you'd be astounded at how much I could I could write. Now until the rest of my life. I've got uh, 63 gigs of two terabytes. Oh, you have a lot of space left. So there. I got a lot of I got a lot of stuff I could write on there. That's a lot of Ric Flair matches to watch. I got like every every report I've written, and God only knows how long. I should put it together into a giant book. They actually should. If you want my notes from all these wacky shows, it would take ten minutes to put it together, and you could sell it for ten bucks. It's not going to take ten minutes, dude. They're all separate files. Oh, 
that is different then. Yeah. I have to find some some fella to do it. So anyway, I really like this match and thought it was great. So then we watched another great match. Ric Flair versus Mr. Pervert from WWF Monday Night Raw, January 25th, 1993. So it was noted totally different. Very different. Because it did involve Sting. There was no Sting anywhere to be seen. So I forget exactly how they set it up, but as I recall, Flair and Pervert had been feuding, and then they announced this match with one week's build. Yes. And it was loser leaves WWF because, well, Flair had... He was leaving the WWF. Yeah, Flair had, had, had done everything he wanted to do. He wanted to go back to WCW, and Vince said, I have done everything I need to do with you. You can go back to WCW. So they did this match. You know, I thought about this match. It was probably the same with the Sting match as well, but this one, it really struck me. I think this entire match, start to finish, was called in the ring. Oh, I'm sure. I don't think they had one spot other than the finish yeah. from watching it. Because and, and even the finish was, do your finish. Yeah, I mean, there was no real... There was no... Like in the in the Sting match, in a Flair match, Flair will grab something and give it back 90 times. Mm-hmm. And then finally there will be the spot where he gets some sort of heat, okay? And if you watch enough Flair matches, it's not it's not always like sometimes I'll watch a Flair match and and I'll I'll figure well this must be the heat, but then he gives it right back again. Yes. And literally in the Flair Sting match, it wasn't until finally Sting went for a Stinger splash. Arn pulled Flair out of the way, and Sting hit the post and tumbled outside. That was the actual heat. And honest to God, the heat lasted like 10 seconds in a 20-minute yes. match, and then Sting was back on offense again. The heat is usually one figure four, which gets reversed halfway through anyway. Yes. Yeah. So in this match, there really was no spot where Flair got the heat. They See, just they just went back and forth, and Perfect had 80% of the match. I disagree with you. I think there was a very clear heat spot, because I, 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 I noted and talked about it, but I think the thing is, the match was like a half hour long. So 20 minutes later, you may have forgotten it, but Flair sells and sells and sells, and sells and sells and sells. It's like 10 minutes. He, he, he's selling for about nine and a half of them. And then he reverses a whip into the corner, and Mr. Pervert takes a horrifying bump oh, in, that's right. into the it corner. Oh, that's right. It comes up bloody. And he actually does... It, 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 this did not go the way Perfect intended. I don't know if he actually... Actually, I think it did. It's Mr. Perfect. Well, he, well, he took a lot of goofy bumps. This was a very goofy bump, and he came out upside down and head first into the post and upside down to the floor and comes up bleeding. So, yeah. And then and then Flair actually took over but for a while. But even that, he took over for, like, nothing. And, and, and They Hennig did go back and forth a lot Fighting that. back with blood all over the place. Yes. Kurt Hennig is like... He was a heel for, for most of his career. Yeah. But God damn, was he a great baby face. He, he was. It was still very weird. It, well, if you want, the very first spot they did was Flair puts on a headlock and Perfect shoots him off, mm-hmm. but he makes sure to also pull Flair's hair. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> it's still Mr. Perfect. he's an asshole. Yes. He's just the good guy in this feud. He is the heroic asshole. Yes, yes. So, first of all, I mean, like even before the match, if you've never seen the very first episodes, sub episodes of Monday Night Raw, if you were a modern wrestling fan, you've never seen the 1993 episodes of Raw, just load up any one of them and look at Monday Night Raw at the Grand Ballroom at the Manhattan Center. It's a cool building. It's cool. It's small. It's very... It's tiny little thing. Ghetto by today's standards. Yes. And it's a, a weird crowd reaction because by the end, they were all on their feet and they were on their feet for this match and very, very much into it, but they were also silent. Yeah. They weren't cheering for the guy. They would react to the big, big moves, but they, they, it, was, it was rapt attention more, more than anything else. So Rob Bartlett's on commentary. Oh, God. Thankfully, he said almost nothing. It's amazing. But the one, like, he said, like, two things, three things. The first thing he said, these are all off the top of my head. This tells you what an impact they made on me. The first thing is... Flair does a flare flop, and he goes, what was that? He didn't even know what a flare flop was. No. And Vince has to explain a delayed reaction. The second thing he said was Flair poked his eyes. Yes, this is the one I remember. And Bart is very upset that you could take an eye out with that. Don't do that, he says. You'll put somebody's eye out. Yes. Thinking he's being funny, when in fact it's the point of the move. That is the point of the move. Yes. And the third thing he says is at the very end of the match, Vince goes, Rob Bartlett. You've been really quiet. And Rob just goes, I've never seen anything like this. They're beating the hell out of each other. <laughs> that was literally his entire commentary. Yeah. So Heenan on commentary is, of course, all pro Ric Flair. At one point early in the match, Flair bails for the 50th time. 
And he goes over by Heenan. Keenan's going to whisper some advice. Yes. And then Heenan opens up his jacket, and he's got a fucking hammer. <laughs> this hammer is the size of, like, Thor's mallet. Yeah. It's the biggest fucking hammer you've ever seen. And Heenan flashes at him, and then he closes his jacket again, like, to let Flair know, you know if you really need this fucking mallet? I, it's bigger than... It was like Hunter's sledgehammer had nothing on this fucking jacket. I, I think he actually picked up the ring bell hammer and put it in his jacket. That's a big hammer. <laughs> that looked like it'd break the ring bell. But that was awesome. So he had that ready to go if, in case Flair needed it. So his perfect is all uh, is flopping all over the place, bumping like mad. A lot of long submission holds that you don't see anymore in wrestling. Mainly, the UFC has kind of killed the raise the hand three times spot. But there's a long figure four, a long sleeper by both guys. The best is F- Flair has this very long sleeper on, and eventually Pervert almost goes out, and the ref drops the arm once, and it drops. And he raises Pervert's arm twice, and it drops. And he raises Pervert's arm a third time, and the arm stays up, and Pervert fires up, and Heenan's going crazy screaming, That's a lousy rule! It should be twice you raise a man's hand! I, I did love that. Which is both funny, but also true. <laughs> there's a reason there's no three arm dropping rule in UFC. So Flair has this long figure four spot on, and Heenan's screaming and maybe literally crying, losing his mind. And Vince screams at him, "Relax, you're getting everyone upset. We don't want that. We don't want that. No. The match is very long. It goes through two commercial breaks. What was the botched spot that they did? I don't recall. There's one spot uh, there's- where like. It's, it looked like Perfect was going for a leapfrog, but they ran into each other and fell down. It was really weird. Yeah, that's probably what happened. I mean, I, I left to let Ken in. I was, I was going to watch it. I see. And I left to let him in, and when I came back, it was already over. I see. I mean, when I, when I thought about it later, I'd have to go back and watch. I shouldn't even comment, but I noticed it was messed up. But then when I watched the match a second time today, Flair was working over Perfect's leg, and I was wondering if maybe, like, Perfect went for a leapfrog and the story is that his leg gave out in the middle of the move. That was probably it. But it looked sloppy. It looked like they fucked something up. Another human. No, they're something. not. Ric Flair, are you kidding me? So, Flair uses a gimmick shot, takes over for a while, tries many pins with his feet on the ropes, and then you mentioned Sting was not in this match, but by the, by the last few minutes, I'd almost disagree, because it was just Mr. Perfect playing Sting. He no-sells some chops. Hits a bunch of chops of his own, makes his big comeback. Place is going crazy now. Mister Perfect showing babyface fire is so fucking bizarre. He was, but he was awesome. Pumping his fist and going the crazy. He's firing crazy. up. He's got blood coming down his face. Yes, and they go back and forth a bit. They do a couple of counters, and Perfect is the perfect plex out of nowhere and wins. Flair kicks out at three point one. Bobby Heenan is losing his mind, insisting the shoulder was up before that. He's just going crazy and hog wild. He tears off his headset and goes screaming to the referee. And Vince, Vince is uh, peak Vince McMahon says Bobby Heenan is besieged with apoplexy. <laughs> Cried with laughter. You know what's amazing? Vince's commentators in 2019 are all horrible. Yes, but they're horrible in large part because they're doing, repeating what he says. But no, no one can say except Vince. Yes. When he says it, it's awesome. Yes. When anyone else tries to be Vince, it sucks. Yes. So it's a hell of a match in an era when Monday Night Raw was still mostly squashes. That's the other thing you got to keep in mind. This is not the Raw of the Monday Night Wars of 2019 where they, they, there's stars in every event. Raw in the early 90s was still mostly squashes. And you might see like Hacksaw, Duggan, and I don't know, King Kong Bunny in a main event or something. So Flair versus Perfect Loser Leaves Town giving it their all was a special, special thing in these days. Now, the other weirdest part about all this is even Vince calls this the biggest win of Mr. Perfect's career, and it may actually have been. So you got babyface Mr. Perfect. He turned, I remember he turned the Survivor Series because Warrior left. Yep. He said he's been feuding with Flair since then. He, he, he beats him here to send the guy packing. He beats Ric Flair in a Loser Leaves the Promotion match. Legit. Flair actually left the promotion. Mm-hmm. What do they do with him? I have no, I, zero memory of Babyface Mr. Perfect after this. I feel like he was back on commentary pretty soon. Did his back give out after that? Uh, his back gave out in 91. After the flare, or the... the, the it was the, a Bret, the Bret yes. Hart SummerSlam. Yeah. This so his back long, was already a mess. So maybe he just had one more great match in him. And obviously he's wrestling on Nitro in, in, in 2000, so he's not totally dead, but yeah. I, I have zero, member, zero memory of... Of Babyface Mr. Perfect, the rest of 1993. So he retired Ric Flair, 
And then he went on to feud with the debuting Lex Luger. And that, I'm hmm. sure, was something else. And then he's just doing stuff like qualifies for King of the Ring, beating Doink. And then he disappears for a while and comes back at WrestleMania. So not a lot. No. They need a guy, and maybe Flair got to choose the guy. That's possible. That's possible. But anyway, the other thing I know to hear is Mr. Perfect's music tape is going bad. Because they didn't have DVDs or MP3s yeah. or yeah, CDs. They had a, a tape. It was an actual cassette tape. Yes. And it's going bad. Mm-hmm. So hopefully they can fix that sometime soon. Yep, loved this match. Thought it was great. The, 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 if you want to know one thing, what's one thing you can get out of this match that's different from other Ric Flair or Mr. Perfect matches? Like If you want to watch one great thing about it, it is the intensity of both men before the bell rings. Yes. They are selling this like it is among the biggest matches of their entire careers. Mm-hmm. Even Vince says, I think they're being too tentative. Yes. He wants more action. Like After the bell rings, there's a long... A few of them, very long stare downs. Yeah, because they know if they mess something up, they have to leave yes. WWE. Yes. And it starts slow and it starts tentative, and Vince is impatient. Yes. But that was how the match built, and by the end, the people were into it. But even that made it better. Even though I think Vince was legit a little upset at Ric Flair and Mr. Perfect being so uh, uh, methodical, uh, Heenan is there to play the other side of the coin and say, no, no, no. It's so important, they can't afford to make a mistake. Which made the whole thing feel more. Believable and authentic, like an actual sporting event. Which, you know, what a concept. The other thing that I liked about it is... I like, the more we talk about this match, the more I like it. This match was awesome. It was unbelievable. Uh, yes. So, the other thing I liked about it was, here is a big difference between Mr. Perfect and Sting when they do a flare match, okay? Mm-hmm. Sting's character is Superman. Right. Superman is always played by a handsome man. Sure. You know what I mean? He's got the little curl in the front and... No facial hair. Always clean cut. Handsome yes. guy. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So Sting plays Superman. He's He's got paint on and everything like that. But like you chop him a few times and he's Superman. Oh. Mr. Perfect is just an ugly motherfucker. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so when you chop Sting, Sting just puffs his chest out and Flair knows, oh my God, like he's invincible right now. I have no kryptonite. He's all fucking scared. Yeah. He, at the end of this match, he fucking throws a chop at, at Mr. Perfect, and Mr. Perfect just... I, I can't even describe his face. He looks like the axe. <laughs> it's not like, I hit Superman. It's like, I hit a big, tough motherfucker who's going to beat the shit out of me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Superman's going to save the day. The axe is going to beat the shit out of you. It's two different things. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, what was the... Uh, we were just talking about this the other day. Oh, it was uh, the the acolytes. Like we don't get paid to beat people up. We get paid to protect people. Sure, that's Superman. He gets paid. He's 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 a protector. He's a protector. Yes, the axe is not a protector. No, the axe is a killer. So yeah, I, I fucking loved it. Perfect is just such a fucking great baby face. He's just great. The better heel. <laughs> he's a much better heel. But he's an on. That's like back in the day. Like I don't know. Just be. Be, be an extension of yourself. I just picture... Because Kurt Hennig is not a superhero. I picture Bailey, if she ever turned heel, like it's just not going to work. You don't say. They're going to write the same stupid heel dialogue they write for everybody else. She's going to bury a sports team. She's going to call out some woman for whatever. It's just going to be whatever. Like, back then, you could be a heel or a babyface, and you could be great at either if you were great. Like you just understood if you were if you were a great heel, you knew what it meant to be a great baby face, and if you were a great baby face, you understood what it meant to be a great heel. And it's not just yelling at people or fucking clapping your hands. Right. So God damn it was great. Anyway, that's the reviews. Good thing we didn't watch more. I've been here all night. Watch Ric Flair, everybody. Especially if you're a young wrestler today. Watch Ric Flair. Watch him get the most out of everything. Yes. Out of every single thing he does. He's the best. You're gonna be mine all night long. So, if you want to follow along, what date is it, Vinny? The date, Brian, is August 20th, 1988. Excellent reporting, Vince. Why, thank you, sir. The show was kind of boring. It was long, it it had its moments, but this was a good one hour show stretched over two hours. 
Yeah, you can always tell the long shows when Brad Armstrong's out there for 20 minutes doing a prelim match. That didn't help. That that kind of killed me there. The most interesting stuff is actually happening off screen as this is the week where everybody was expecting the company to be sold. Mm. And it is being sold imminently. So Ted Turner's about to take over and then things change. So that's a big story. Ron Garvin quit. Right after turning heel, Mm -hmm. he'll be showing up soon in WWF as Rugged. Rugged Ronnie Garvin. Ronnie Garvin. And they will do nothing with him. Yes. And Tim Horner quit. Oh, no. I I was unaware Tim Horner was even there, and I'm not sad that he quit. (laughs) And amazingly, I can't remember who it was. might have been Rotundo, but like he was feuding... With one of the varsity club over the title, believe it or not. Say what now? Yeah, Tim Horner on the road and everything. I see. But he quit. Okay. And then the show opened up with Kevin Sullivan and Al Perez trying to choke the life out of Brad Armstrong. We never found out who, what, when, where, or why. No, that's uh, that's all the information. And then when the show was over, we watched the first few minutes of next week's show. And Kevin Sullivan and Al Perez were trying to choke the life out of Brad Armstrong. They showed the same footage again. They did. What? I don't I don't know. But yes, let's keep this in mind, everyone. The show opens with clips of Al Perez taking a steel chain, putting it around the neck of Brad Armstrong, and attempting to, attempting to choke him to death. The, the announcers flat out said he was trying to choke the life. Yes. Out of Brad Armstrong. D- just, Sounds like a felony. Just set that aside. Yes. So we go to the announcers. It's Tony Schiavone, Jim Ross, and David Crockett. They promised there will be two title matches in the show. The Florida Championship will be on the line. Oh, prestigious. The the TV Championship will be on the line. Also prestigious. We will have many special interviews with David Crockett. And then Jim Ross lists who's going to be on the show. And when I say who's on the show, he listed, I think, every single person on the show. People who were on the show last week. People who were on the show years ago. He just going on and on and on. Al Perez, Ricky Morton, Nikita Koloff. Rick Steiner, Mike Rotunda, Kevin Sullivan, Rick Flair, Tully Blanchard. He's going on and on and on. But they were all on the show. They, they were. But if you watch Shivani, Shivani's standing there. And he's got his mic. He's very professional and looking at the camera. And the longer Ross goes, Shivani just does, does the slow burn. <laughs> How long are you going? And then finally, he shut up. And oh, what a match we got when he shut up. Al Perez versus Jerry Price. Incredibly boring. Here's everything I wrote. Jerry Price is terrible. Al takes his time. Wins with spinning toehold. I wrote incredibly boring spinning toehold finish. We are both right. I wrote literally nothing more. It went way, way, way longer than it needed to be. I did note it's clearly a two-hour show because of the length. Yep. Like, if this would have been the 38-minute show last week, this match would have been like 30 seconds, which would have been a massive improvement. Like, every time I start to like Al Perez, shit like this happens. Yes. That it's like, I, I can't handle it. So then we have David Crockett in one of his many special interviews talking to Gary Hart and Al Perez. Excellent. Here is his question. And it's a good one. Is it? I thought so. David Crockett says Al Perez has a lot of finesse. He's a very good finesse wrestler. But is he mean enough to face a man like Dusty Rhodes? That is an excellent question, Vinny. No, it's not, Brian. I'll tell you why it is. Okay. Okay. If this were WWE, David would have said... Al Perez, do you think that you could beat Dusty Rhodes? Okay. That's a stupid fucking question. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it is possible that you can be a great technical wrestler and have a lot of finesse and be very good at your job, but not be mean. And when you face a a guy like Dusty Rhodes, Mm -hmm. who, if you recall, when he was a babyface as the Midnight Rider, he broke every goddamn rule in the book and was out there trying to fucking kill people. Yes. You need a goddamn mean streak. Okay, Brian, in a vacuum, this would be a perfectly fine question. Yes. And a valid, valid query here in an interview. Five minutes ago, I watched Al Perez take a chain and try to kill a man in front of an arena full of witnesses. Well, sure, yeah. I think Al's mean enough. Well, maybe There's no question in my mind that he is mean enough to face Dusty Rhodes. Maybe David hadn't seen that footage. Or well, maybe, like me, he forgot all about it because it was Al Perez and it was so fucking boring. Regardless, it then leads to Gary Hart, one of the stars of this show. Bright lights of this show. Gary says, fighting Dusty Rhodes is like fighting a Brahma bull, except after it throws you off, it comes back to stomping you some. 
and Alperez is a young lion, but Dusty is a seasoned veteran with numerous injuries. All Al has to do is find that particular area that is not 100%. Now, if Al picks up 280, 300-pound Dusty Rhodes, if he hits that spinning slam of his, first of all, it would probably break the ring. But afterwards, if he hooked that toe hold, Dusty Rhodes is not the kind of man who would be, let himself be pinned or submit to alleviate the pain. So therefore, the leg must go. The leg, the cartilage, the tendon, something's got to go. There's only three options. Yes. You get pinned, mm-hmm. you give up, or you have your leg destroyed. Yeah. Now, before this year is over, he, J.J. Dillon, Kevin Sullivan, maybe some other people, we will make sure Dusty Rhodes is done in the business. And he addresses Dusty. Dusty won't come out to face him. He says, I don't know what else I have to do. Maybe I need to slap your ugly wife. I have insulted your daddy. I have insulted your mama. I didn't insult your sister. I just told the truth about her. But as far as I can tell, Dusty Rhodes, you may not have lost your belly, but you've lost your guts. An incredible promo. Gary Hart is so fun. Hit every button. Every button. Including calling Dusty fat. (laughs) I mean, he got them all in there. And Dusty still won't come out and face Al Perez. I mean, I don't blame the guy. Dusty has been gone for weeks. Yeah. He, he, the, I mean, he, I wouldn't be itching for a match with El Perez either at this rate. Texas Outlaws reunited, and he's been vanished since then. The Fantastics then face a team whose name I am not making up. The Menace and Jim Boss. All right, I got to talk a little about Jim Boss. Please. <laughs> First off, his name is Jim Boss. Jim Boss. Jim Boss. Not Jimmy Boss. Not even James Boss. No, Jim Boss. Jim Boss. Like, you go to the gym. Yes. He's the Jim Boss. He's the Jim Boss. So, the Jim Boss is out here. It's spelled J-I-M, by the way, everybody. But it's Jim Boss. Sure. He's out there, and he is wearing this incredible... Like, Ric Flair used to pay, like, $5,000 legit for his robes. Yes. I mean, Jim Boss must have paid, like, every cent he ever made in wrestling. <laughs> this this <laughs> golden, sparkling sequined robe. Sequined gold robe. There's no way Jim Jim Boss's pro wrestling career turned to profit. And by the way... You're taking the expense of this robe. They show the names on the screen, and before the Fantastics come out, for, like, less than one second, we get a glimpse of Jim Boss. <laughs> Everything... That I talked about for 30, 40, 50, 60 seconds right there, all stemmed from that split second that I saw. He was on the screen. A glimpse of Jim Boss. About four frames. Yeah. You always hear about people that say, I saw Bigfoot. He ran across the road. I was in my car going 60. And then, you know, they explain everything about this Bigfoot that they saw. Mm-hmm. And it's like, how the fuck would you possibly remember all that? This, this fucking creature ran out in front of your car. In the middle of the night, you saw it for a split second. Now I understand. Yeah. I could talk about Jim Boss for the rest of my life, and I saw him for the merest of instances. Yes. He kind of looks a little bit like Brian Pillman from behind. He, he, he's he got a pretty good physique. He's built. He's got the, the he's, curly-haired mullet. He has the Pillman, Brad Armstrong mullet. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. He, he looks like a wrestler. He looks like a Especially guy. Especially a 1980s Jabba wrestler. And he's named Jim Boss. And he has a great name, Jim Boss, and yep. a great robe. And he takes his robe off. I'm not even there yet, Vinny. All right. I'm just talking about the split second that I saw him. All right. I just looked at this guy, and I thought, how, who the fuck is Jim Boss? You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Like, how have we never heard of Jim he, Boss before? He must be somebody. He must have achieved something. This is a lesson for everybody listening to this that wants to be a pro wrestler. I saw this guy for a split second, and all I could think was, he must be somebody. Jim Boss. You know, if you combined Al Perez and Jim Boss, you'd have one hell of a pro wrestler. You sure would. Yeah. Now, I did a little research, and I still don't know who the fuck Jim Boss is, okay? okay. Yeah. But I do know that he's around for a while. Okay, good. Because he has squash matches with, like, Eligante, who's oh, wow. ways away. Yeah, three years. So, way. like, he, Four years. he must have improved because he fucking sucked. He was beyond horrible oh, here. Oh, my God, he was terrible. I forgot how awful he was. I was so in, in, in so into his look and his gear that I forgot how badly he sucked until I looked over my notes here. My favorite moment on this show. <laughs> and it's such a dumb thing to screw up. It's not like some of these other fuckers that just screw up everything, okay? Yeah. He's on his hands and knees, and Tommy Rogers walks up. Yeah. And he stomps on his fingers. And, of course, 
for those of you listening, I hate to break kayfabe, but it's fake. Right. You don't really step on the guy's you fingers. You do not break his fingers with his foot. No. Jim Boss doesn't sell his fingers at all. We need, we need to... It's not that he no-sold this. He anti-sold it. Yes. He didn't realize that Tommy had stomped on his fingers at all. No. So he didn't... Which move. really is not his fault, but it was so funny. I mean, he didn't... I mean... It would be one thing if, like, I mean, clearly a man, he's in the ring doing a match with a guy, and that guy jumped and stomped really loud. That's indisputable. And to not move a single muscle? He didn't flinch, you know? No, he did nothing. (laughs) And Tommy Rogers looks down at the fingers, he looks at the guy not selling, and he he paused for a long time. Then he looks up and he looks right at the referee. And they just look at each other for a second. And he looks down, and he picks him up, and he just keeps going. They just kept going. <laughs> shit, you know, shit happens. Here's the story of this show, everybody. I thought I would have nothing to say about this show, but as we get going, I have plenty to say. The story of this show is the story of being a worker, and being a good worker or a bad worker, in my eyes, okay? Sure. This is just my opinion. If Jim Cornette's listening and he disagrees, well, that's his opinion, okay? In my opinion, a large part of being a good worker is... You must work to the level of your opponent. Sure. If your opponent is a fucking dipshit, don't do anything with them. You must idiot-proof the match so they have to do the absolute least possible so that you can try to get a match out of them and not have it be an embarrassment. And I hate to jump ahead, but everybody's favorite guy who was such a great worker, but he just didn't have the personality... Brad Armstrong had the shittiest match ever that we're going to get to in a minute because he decided that he was going to run spots with somebody that fucking sucked. And so on this show, we have we have workers who are good workers because they work to the level of these idiots and they drag decent matches out of them. Then we have the guys who try to have a match with someone who is not capable of having a match and their match gets fucked up and they will invariably blame the other guy when in reality, they should be blaming themselves. So anyway, it wasn't really Jim Boss's fault that this got fucked up. Tommy Rogers was trying to idiot-proof this. I'm going to stomp on the motherfucker's fingers. He just has to grab them. Yeah. <laughs> like, he managed to fuck that up he, he legit snuck up on the guy. <laughs> yes. And, and, and Jim Boss was looking exactly the wrong way. He was too light. He, he was too light. <laughs> yes. Shit happens. Sometimes shit. when the guy is not looking at you, you got to hit him a little harder. Yeah. Yes. I, I I remember once... Buddy and Richie were putting the boots to me, and I'm, I'm down on all fours, and here goes Richie to throw a boot at my head, and bang! Got me in the head. Oh, got me in the head. Oh, well, shit happens. Throws another kick. Bang! Got me in the head. And I was like, man, he's having a rough night. Third kick. Bang! Gets me in the head again. I'm like, okay, clearly I had done something wrong to Richie. I don't know what I did, but I pissed him off somehow. And it turns out, no, he just wanted to make sure I would sell them. So he kicked me in the back of the head. If he's light in the back of the head, I wouldn't know. He wouldn't know they were there. So it's fine. After the first time, you should have fucking turned around, you idiot. Man, <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> well, it's the first goddamn thing I think about. F- Fifteen years later, I figured it out. Yes. So I want to talk more about Jim Boss. Because, yes, he's got the mullet. I believe he even has sunglasses, and he's got the robe. It looks like a star. And then he removes his entrance gear. He is wearing mustard yellow tights with, like, beige knee pads and leopard print wraps. Under his knees, under his knee pads. A brilliant look. A brilliant look. He fucking sucked. They did this match. The Menace was hardly any better. The Menace was like a nobody guy who went out and bought a size quadruple XL singlet. So the straps are always falling down repeatedly. We've talked way longer about this match than it actually went. The Fantastics win with a standing rocket launcher. And Jim Ross notes, not a real stern test for these men. You know what that wasn't? was a stern test for these men. No. Jim Crockett, or David, Jim Crockett. <laughs> David Crockett interviews Lex Luger. He asked a question about the mental contest with Ric Flair, and I, I don't know what Lex said. Lex was boring, had nothing to say. Well, you know what's funny about this, Vinny? Mm-hmm. I thought, man, this is fucking boring. Yeah. Can we get to this goddamn match already? Like, he just comes out every week and he talks about a future match, and I'm bored by it. Well, the answer is, sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. They've been doing this match on the road, yeah. and it was drawing very well. Okay. So, whatever you thought about the finish of that Baltimore match, mm-hmm. how shitty it was, and how mad people were, 
They were so mad they paid okay. to see it again in their town. Fair enough. So they did something right here. Good for them. Yeah. But yes, it was boring. <laughs> the Russian assassin versus Robbie Allman. All I want to talk about. All, all, I, all I. My only question. I must know the title of the Russian assassin's ring music. Are we sure it's not the Russian national anthem? It's some. Maybe I don't know. It's some Russian army march or Soviet army march. I tried to use Shazam to identify it. It failed. There's too much crowd noise going on. It's awesome. It, it's this. It's uh, th- th- this. Like Star Wars, Darth Vader, Imperial March kind of song, but I'm sure it's like Russian, Russian instead of from Star Wars. Good call, Vinny. Thank you. Can I idiot proof this show? <laughs> it's a Russian song. Thank you. Ryan. Okay, I'll see what I can do. Uh, the match itself. Tony Schiavone says, "If you want to see a classic mismatch, you got one." <laughs> and I thought, you know what? I do like seeing classic mismatches, and I kind of miss them in wrestling. Today. Oh, absolutely. So can we bring them back already? We need more mismatches for sure. Uh, Robbie Allman, there was a spot here where he was supposed to take a backdrop, and I think he thought he was taking a flapjack, and the assassin thought he was doing a backdrop, and it could have been a tragedy, but thank God the Russian assassin is really, really big and strong. And it kept him up high in the air and flipped him over, and that was that. He won with the Russian guillotine. Paul Jones stomps the shit out of Allman on the outside with his cowboy boots, kicking him with the tip right to the head. Nice. Fucking Teddy Long turns around and catches him. Says, you gotta knock that off. <laughs> and then... Paul Jones throws the guy into the ring and whips him in the ass with a riding crop, all in front of the ref. Teddy Long doesn't do anything about it. Teddy Long actually is worse than Nick Patrick, which is a fucking... That's a tough one. Mm-hmm. So then Crockett interviews Jones and the assassin. <laughs> this is awesome. The Russian assassin, I don't think we've ever said this, it's the angel of death. He's a big scary guy who was around in the 80s, worked everywhere. So he's standing there, but he's supposed to be Russian here. So he's got his mask on, and he stands there with his arms crossed, and he's just silent. And Paul Jones, first Crockett says, you know, I'm not m- much impressed with this win over this five foot 10, 200 pound man. Let's see what happens when you face the Road Warriors. You got to admit, Paul Jones, you blew it against the Road Warriors this summer. And Paul Jones does admit everyone is telling him he yes. has blown it against the Road Warriors. Everyone's calling him a failure, which is just what they said about Abraham Lincoln. And then he became the president. It is funny because he's talking about how... God damn, I wrote a lot about this. There's a man who failed multiple times. He was a failure throughout his life. Or something like that. Yeah. And he finally says, Abe Lincoln. And David Crockett, as sincere as ever, goes, that's true. <laughs> David Crockett's so awesome. Paul Jones just kept going. Paul Jones says, I failed for three months in the summer. That doesn't mean life is over. It means I have to regroup. I have to rethink. I regrouped when I had two guys who were too scared to climb the scaffold. Now it's time to regroup again. Everyone knows Ivan Koloff is my weak link. I have given Ivan time off to think about this. Ivan admitted he was not holding up his end. And by the way, he did say, admitted. Paul Jones does. He has to bang the table all the time. He said he would return at 110%. Now, this Russian assassin... He can beat any three men together. If I could talk to him, I could teach him a lot quicker. He would be the powers of pain overnight. So I need you, Ivan. But you've got to be an example. An image of myself. He repeats his line, I want victims, not victories. So among the greatness here, I like just, there's a very simple reason he didn't just get pissed at Ivan and fire him right away. He needs a translator. Ivan is a useful translator from English to Russian and back. Yeah. As it is, Paul Jones cannot instruct the Russian assassin. He can merely observe. So even as he, even though he has fucked up all summer, Ivan Koloff still has value. So we'll see how this goes. Ricky Morton versus Dave Spearman. High cross finish. That's my notes. Ricky comes anything? out. Under, under his name, it still says Rock and Roll Express in the graphics. Well, he, rock and Roll Express forever, he noted in his He, he didn't know Rock and Roll will never die. No, he said the Rock and Roll Express will never die. <laughs> he specifically said the Express. Okay. Yeah. We'll see how that, how, how that works out. So Ricky is doing Well, his... they didn't. <laughs> I just wrestled him. They are still going strong. Fair enough. 2018. Uh, Ricky, regardless, is going to be a singles guy for a while here, while here, so he's being very experimental. Fucking Crockett Cup 2019. That's true. That's yeah. right. 
So he takes the guy to the corner and like drives his chin into Spearman's arm for a while. That's a new one. I believe at one point in this match he did a bottom rope back elbow. Also a new one. And eventually, yes, Brian, he did win with a body press. Yes. David Crockett, very excited to interview Ricky. Ricky says, I have been wrestling a ta- mostly in tag team matches these past four years. The very dapper David Crockett he was for some reason described as. <laughs> he says, I haven't forgotten anything Flair did to my nose, anything Ric Flair did to my face. And remember, Ric Flair, I took you to the limit several times. And I take my hat off to you. You're a great champion. It's all about being the world heavyweight champion of the world. He says, for everything that's uh, gone down between us, I'm still here, he says. The Rock and Roll Express will live forever. I want to take this time to say hi to those folks in the boys club in the crowd. Yeah. And he waves. Says, you always say to be the man, you have to beat the man. That's bull crap, he says. And he never explained why. Well, I think because he had... Because he took him to the limit? Because he drew the man. But he didn't beat him. He did not beat him. So he's not the man. (laughs) Yes. This is self-explanatory, Ricky. Take it up with Ricky. A match deep from the bowels of hell. This match actually happened on the planet Earth. <laughs> like, if there's a newer testament someday, mm. the newest testament... This is the end times. I mean, this fucking better be in there. Kendall Wyndham and Italian Stallion versus Don Valentine and Keith Steinborn. Yes. The best worker in this match... By a thousand miles is the Italian Stallion. Yes. Then there is a deep, deep drop off. First to Kendall Wyndham, I believe. Yeah. Then another deep drop off to Keith Steinborn. And then the deepest of deep drop offs to Don Valentine, who remains the worst wrestler I've ever seen. He is at the bottom of the deepest part of the ocean. First of all, Keith Steinborn starts. And they're wrestling him for a long time. They are determined. Think about this. They want Keith Steinborn to stay in the ring. So they don't have to work with Don Valentine. They keep Keith Steinborn in the ring forever and ever. And so it's boring, because they're not very good, and he's not very good. The only thing to talk about is how Kendall Wyndham is the skinniest fucker ever. Yeah, but you know what? The announcers just talk and talk about how he's put on weight, which I'm skeptical of. I'm looking at him like on his skinniest, Zack Sabre Jr. is is Lex Luger compared to this guy. I'm not sure about that. It is skinniest. They were about the same here. I'm thinking this, and then Shivani tells me, He's getting bigger and stronger than ever. Yeah. They, he is? They said. Was he transparent before? He was. He had no definition. <sighs> he was that skinny with no definition. Now he's kind of got a little definition. They said that he was putting on weight and soon he would be among the best ever. They did say that. That didn't happen. His biggest sort drawback has been his lack of bulk. That's that one of them. Then they say, you got to remember, folks, he's not. he doesn't have a lot of bulk, but he's a very young man. He'll get bigger. Okay, if that's true... Well, he did. I guess eventually he did. The, the Kendall win on the Nitro was bigger than this. It's much bigger. That's true. But, I mean, if you're telling me he's skinny because he's 20 years old, why isn't every college football player a skinny wimp? Well, Vinny, don't overthink this. Let so, me, meanwhile... Let me say something about this Don Valentine before we even get into talking about him. I got to put him over before we no! carry him. Yes. He came back. That's your that's your praise? That is my praise. He's too dumb to know when to quit? Last week, <laughs> I don't want to use the term rape, but Kevin Sullivan, he just violated this guy in every fucking way possible, except for literally one. He did not have sex with him. <laughs> <laughs> other than that, he ruined this guy. Did he not? It was a violent beating. He fucking... It was, he tried to kill him it was on illegal, television. It was a legal assault. Yes. And despite that, Don Valentine came back. See, this is not. Th- this makes me hate him more. No, he, he should have known when to quit. No, no, no. He he wanted to give it another shot. He was determined. He this thought, just means Kevin you know Sullivan had to beat him more next time. You know time. what? I can do this. He thought, even though he couldn't. He was very, very wrong. <laughs> he thought very, you know, very wrong. Maybe he thought I'll give it one more shot. Maybe I'll be good this week. <laughs> okay, it's a little praise. But I could not believe he came back Dude. after after what Sullivan did to him last week. You know what? After watching him wrestle, I'm not sure he did. Oh, he came back. I realize he was physically there. They eventually they, they keep Keith Steinborn in as long as they can. He is grotesque in his gear. Which one? Did we mention that last week? Which one? Fucking Valentine. Oh, okay, he is. <laughs> He's got that goddamn singlet with the skinny straps, and his boobs just hang out. Yes. It's just, why do you wear that? His noodle arms. 
It's just disgusting. So listen, Keith Steinborn, eventually he gets blown up. They have no choice. They must tag in Don Valentine. Don Valentine gets in the ring, and I swear to God, he's halfway through his lockup, and we are already laughing. He hasn't made contact. <laughs> he hasn't even locked up. He, he gets as far as... No, not even that, Vinny. He looks like the mummy. He, he puts his hands up like this, like he's a T-Rex. <laughs> like they're bent. I'm not sure. Like he's going to sneak up on somebody or something. He he he, move, he looks and moves like the mummy, but more slower. So they do what they can with him. It sucks. And here is the finish. They tag in Kendall. Kendall's finish is the middle rope bulldog. What could be easier? He goes flying off the ropes. He goes flying past Don Valentine's head. Don Valentine does not move. Time passes. Eventually, he slumps to the mat. Then Kendall goes to turn him over. And I'm honestly not sure whose fault this was. This may have been Kendall's fault. But all Kendall wants to do is, like, shoot the half and roll him over and pin him. And Kendall accidentally puts him in a sugar hold. Yeah. He's got his neck pinned forward. Like he's trying to crank it forward. He has to get up and let go and then cover and pin him. One of the very worst three-minute TV tag matches I'll ever see. Just, and I, I listen. I'm positive. Just horrible. I'm positive. Don Valentine is the worst wrestler I've ever. I become I, his his first appearance was still the worst. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> he fucked up the bulldog. He did the finish, and then they show the replay. Oh, that's right. I, that's, and normally they show the entire replay, no matter how bad it looks. Uh, but this time it was just like WWE. They stopped as soon as Kendall put his arm around the guy's head. They didn't even show the rest of it. They just go into the commercial. That was bad. He's the worst wrestler I've ever seen. I'm positive. I, I, I do get more convinced of that every I'm week. I'm positive. I've never seen as a the, worse pro wrestler. As the evidence piles up. Yes. And, and and no evidence to the contrary, by the way. He's batting a 1,000. No, and, I, and it, honest, honest to God, I'm not sure anyone's close. <laughs> that other geek. The gap between him and J.C. Wild. J.C. fucking Wild. Like, he's worse than J.C. Wild. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. He's 100 times worse he than He might be Wild. twice as bad, which is inconceivable. Who was the big guy they brought in to be a Russian who he vastly improved by the end of the summer? But would, I know you're talking about, but no. He, he's, he, he's, he was way better than this nowhere guy. Nowhere close. No, but anyway. Uh, the spam slam of the week is the Doomsday Device. Mike Rotunda and Kevin Sullivan, Kevin Sullivan come out for a promo. I love this. So there's a moment where Mike Rotunda is supposed to be talking about how he has defended his belt at the bash. Okay? Mm -hmm. So he starts out by saying, Ah, these stupid people in the crowd, they boo me, but I'm a Syracuse graduate. I'm smarter than all of them. I successfully defended my bash. He realizes he said the wrong word. So he stops and he goes, What's that, you people? Listen to these people, David. What did I tell you? A bunch of idiots. Not like myself, a Syracuse graduate. So he's going to go back and start over again hoping that you won't notice and right before he starts to speak <laughs> fucking David Crockett goes yeah they're so annoying they cause you to forget what you're trying to say <laughs> it's like if I were Mike Rotundo I would have grabbed that motherfucker by the neck and twisted around like a fucking chicken <laughs> all Rotundo does he pauses and he just says maybe a little bit and he goes on. Jesus. Oh, that was The awesome. anti-Gene Okerlund. <laughs> yes. Awesome. I'm going to make sure that your interview is worse by the time I'm done I with you. make you look goofy as possible. So the point is, Rotunda finishes. He got through all those bashes. He still has his belt. He's going to keep it as long as he wants. Sullivan changes the subject to Dusty Rhodes. Says, yes, Dusty, you're going to go to the Hall of Fame, but we'll make sure you go to the Hall of Fame on a stretcher. Which, by the way... When Dusty went into the WWE Hall of Fame, he should have been shown up on a stretcher. Yeah. That would have been awesome. Storyline consistency. Yes. Says, Gary Hart's after you. J.J. Dillon's after you. Everyone who watched us in Florida knows I'll attack you in a bar. I'll attack you in a parking lot. You're not safe anywhere. Your head belongs to us. And he storms off. And Rotunda's about to leave. He stops and grabs the mic and says, that's right. And he leaves. <laughs> the Varsity Club is great. Now, here's the other thing about this. Steiner is starting to get popular. He sure is. This is the idea. That is why they kicked him out of that prior promo. So the, the fans wouldn't cheer him, and in fact would boo when they said they were keeping him in the back. He's in the doghouse where he belongs. So we have Rick Steiner versus Tony Suber for the prestigious Florida Heavyweight oh, Championship. Oh, this match was beautiful. 
Tony Suber is the big black guy. He's bigger than Rick Steiner. Yeah, they got like a win, and then they never did anything with him afterwards. Yes, yes. But he's not bad. No. And Rick Steiner gets in there, and I'm pretty sure this was the idea. I think Rick told Tony Suber, I, I'm going to take you down, and I want you to try and stop it. Yeah. Because... That's what happened. He went for takedown after takedown, and Suber tried unsuccessfully to counter every takedown, mm-hmm. and Rick fought and got every one. Basically, yeah. And then he suplexed him all over the place, pinned him with a belly-to-belly, and I could watch this match a thousand times in succession and not get tired of it. The other great part about this is that Rick Steiner was wrestling a pretty, for the most part, a clean match, but the Varsity Club was cheating more frequently than anyone since the heyday of Jimmy Valiant. They were interfering all the time. They Steiner pushes Suber to the apron and takes the ref, or to the corner and takes the ref. Rotunda jumps on the apron and starts throwing in clubbing forearms. Kevin Sullivan is out on the outside trying to tie Suber's bootlace to the ropes. <laughs> this did not work. They keep on interfering. They keep on wrestling. There, there were certainly points here where I, I'm 100% convinced you're right. They, they, they were. Rick said, I'm, or, I'm, I'll try to take you down, fight back, or try to take me down, I'll stop you. Yeah. Because there was a there was a legit athletic competition going on for a while. Loved it. And then, yes, he did one big giant German suplex, and he actually hit an overhead belly-to-belly on this 300-pound monster, because Rick Steiner's the scariest man in the entire company. And he wins, and so for as much as Rotunda and Sullivan bully Steiner, he got the job done here. They shook his hand for a job well done. Yes. Because they're still a unit. The Varsity Club is great. Crockett interviews Flair. A very significant interview with Ric Flair. We see every week doing uh, a very special significant interview. Yes, interview. Yes. Uh, the other horsemen are there, but Flair did all the talking. Says Ric Flair is a giant, but, or excuse me, Lex Luger is a giant, but all those other giants stumbled and fell like Nikita Koloff, like Hawk, like Animal. Luger, you may be the most perfect athlete God ever put on this earth, but to face me, Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, Barry Windham, you're playing against a stacked deck. And the fact is, <laughs> it was a little funny because the, 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 he talked about why, how, why it's important for them to stay on top. He says, we like the money, we like the notoriety, we like the prestige, but what we like best is knowing anyone who sees us knows they have seen the very best. So even they, though they are dirty, cheating, selfish, unsportsmanlike bastards, at the end of the day, they still have pride. And they want you to think they are the best. They like what they're doing. They like the ladies. They like being the best. They like walking walking out of fancy hotels and having people mark out for them. It was a great promo. It was a great Ric Flair promo. We went from a great Ric Flair promo to a Brad Armstrong match. Ah. So here was a match where Brad Armstrong goes in there and he's trying to do high spots with Max MacGyver. Yeah. Just get one fucked up high spot after another. And then Brad's got that look on his face like he's pissed off. And it's like, this is your fault. You're in the ring with Max McGiver. Max McGiver is no, not new. No, he cannot do a high spot off the ropes. He has been on the show every week for years. It doesn't matter. He sucks. That's my, that's my point, though. Yes. Brad Armstrong should have known he sucked. Yes. It's not like he was new. No. Like, if you had one match with Don Valentine, Chris Champion may have never seen Don Valentine before before that match. So I don't blame Chris Champion that much for trying to do kicks with him. Brad Armstrong should have known how terrible Max McGiver is. And tailored his match to that. Instead, he attempted to have a match like he would with anyone else. So there's a lot of blown spots, a lot of headlocks. Right before the finish, there's this huge pop, and I can't tell why. And the announcers say, oh, somebody's coming out for a promo. And Armstrong can't tell why the crowd's cheering. He looks over at the promo area. He's very annoyed. They've taken his TV. They've stolen his spotlight by walking out. Thank God. So they blow another spot, and he hits the leg sweep and wins. It's the Sheep Herders. For this promo, <laughs> David Crockett says, It is always interesting to interview the sheep herders. Look at them. <laughs> it was total insanity. It was awesome. They didn't come 12,000 miles for fun. 12,000 bloody miles. 12,000 bloody miles to win the tag team titles. Yes. They know we've wrestled in 38 countries, won titles in 37 of them. I oh, want to know Go why they never have gotten a title shot. Can't believe the Midnights and their girl manager with the tennis racket. The goody-goody Midnight Express. I've got a title shot before them. I was watching them do aerobics last week on Superstars. Yeah. What a fucking life. <laughs> so they say, 
Jim Cornette's mother is the one who has all the money. She either bought either bought those contracts or did something else to get them. Fighting words. Those are fighting words. Those are fighting words. <laughs> the Midnight Express after the break came out to wrestle Bear Collie and the Black Shadow. I love how he used to be Big Bear Collie, but now he's just Bear Collie. I guess when he loses every week, he stopped being big. <laughs> he's still big. I realize he's big. Why isn't he big anymore? Well, he's a little lowercase big. Lowercase B Come big. On. Before he was Big Bear Collie. Now he's just Bear Collie. So, a subtle thing here. The Midnight Express are the baby faces in this feud with the Four Horsemen. But it's still Stan and Bobby and Cornette, and they've been evil motherfuckers for years in the show. So, it's not like a light switched... Or a flip got switched and no. a switch got flipped. Cornette is undoubtedly still a heel. Cornette is still a heel. The Minute Express are still bastards. They cheat like crazy. They're assholes. They're, they're, they they're no respect to their opponents. But here's the big difference. They are funny when they do it. So now you think, hey. Nah, kind of. These are dicks, but they're funny about Eden's it. always been funny in these squash matches. I thought he took, up another, took it up another level here. Well, here's what I got out of this match. This is why, this is why some of the people in this show were good workers and then there's a guy like Bob Eaton who's an exceptional worker, okay? Mm-hmm. The good workers would take these shitty jobbers, and they wouldn't do anything complicated. They would dummy it down, idiot-proof the match, get through the match, it would be fine, okay, whatever, and they would go to the back. Mm-hmm. Bobby Eaton goes out there, and he wants to not only idiot-proof the match, but somehow also make it entertaining. Yes. Which he managed to do. Because he's Bobby Eaton. He turned around the Black Shadow's mask. He did spots with the guy where he couldn't see because his mask was turned around. Like, he did every trick in the book that was idiot-proof. All this guy has to do is have his mask turned around and stumble around. Yeah. Like, it's hard to fuck that up. Mm -hmm. Although, that other idiot... Don Valentine could. Don Valentine could, but this guy managed to do it. So, he found different ways to make the match fun and exciting, but also keep it completely simple and not fuck anything up. They started, they come out, the music's playing, the match hasn't even begun yet. He walks across the ring and shakes hands with the Black Shadow and Bear Collie. And the bell rings, and Bear Collie wants to shake hands again. And Eaton is confused, but he shakes the man's hand two or three times, and then without letting go, punches him in the face. Yes. Cornet howls with laughter about what a jerk Bear Collie is. So we have the spot with the Black Shadow where he turns the Shadow's mask around, is punching him, takes him with his mask reversed out to the ring to do the punch into the microphone. Then he fixes the mask, so he's looking, so it's the eye holes are the right way, and he points at Ross and says, he did it! They get back in the ring, they do a bunch more stuff. Cornet on commentary says, it's important to respect your elders, and J.J. Dillon is as elder as anyone I've ever seen. When he was in school, they didn't have history. Ooh. That was awesome. Arn Anderson says that when he was with Bobby Eaton, people thought Arn was with an ugly woman. Well, Arn's with an ugly woman every week, so it's a perfectly rational assumption. And anyway, usually Bobby was the one driving because Arn was throwing up in the back seat. He couldn't hold his liquor. Uh, Bobby Eaton does spots where he sits the Black Shadow in a chair and beats him up. Eventually, they hit the rocket launcher on the Black Shadow. They lay a U.S. title belt across his waist. They pin him. Tony Schiavone laments, This was a horrible display. Well... I must disagree. <laughs> so after I this like match, it. where Cornette gets a promo the entire time, it is time for another Jim Cornette promo. Bobby Eaton, I don't know what's going on. Vince has been having a bad okay. day. Stan Lane is posing for the women. Yes. Bobby Eaton is sleeping for He's the first so half of his... He's so bored. He's sleepwalking. He's heard Cornette talk for hours every day. He's over it. He wakes up about halfway through. Cornette makes a joke... Which I didn't write down. J.J. Dillon has had a facelift so many times he's got nipples on his chin. Yes. Stan Lane fucking loses it. <laughs> Just starts howling at that line. I think that might be where Eaton woke up. It might be. And Cornette is the very definition of being a manager who does all the talking. Yes. He is of such value to this crew. Yes. Then when it's over, they all leave, and Bob Eaton stops. And he goes like this, raises his hand up to David... And David's a little bit confused, but he puts his hand up and Eaton high fives him. <laughs> and off they go. Friendly chat, man. And David's so happy. Yes. So the the key line here is Cornette's still running down the babyface teams they've beaten. Wyndham and Garver were nothing to us. The Road Warriors were nothing to us. The Fantastics were nothing to us. The Four Horsemen will be nothing to us. And he stops and says, You know, I've hated the Four Horsemen's guts to begin with. I'm anxious to take them down a peg or two. And the crowd goes crazy. He finally admitted that it's personal and always has been. Mike Rotunda versus Rick Allen for the television championship of the world. So, Steiner's crazy. 
At one point, he thinks he is the ref. He jumps in the ring to make a count. The ref ejects him, so everyone boos. Or Sullivan ejects Steiner, so everyone boos. Uh, Rotunda wins with a double arm suplex, and then Steiner's back to celebrate. Yeah, at one point, Rick comes out and does a quick three count. Sullivan goes in and backstage. People boo, but he gets back in the ring anyway. And They're teasing this breakup too early. It does take you a long time. Yeah, but it just feels like they just got together a little while ago, and they're already teasing it. Yeah. Realize it's not anytime soon, but still. Nikita Koloff versus Russ Tyler. Nikita's back in the red singlet this week. I think for the, thing for the first time since he uh, turned on Uncle Ivan. And maybe it's not a coincidence, because now that I think about it, Jim Ross is on commentary. He's talking about these struggles Ivan is having with Paul Jones. And you know, Nikita and Ivan... They do have a very strong connection, even though they've been walking different paths in wrestling lately. Teasing stuff. Foreshadowing. Nikita won with a sickle. Then he cuts a promo. I guess I understood more than usual. He is chasing Ric Flair. The Midnight Express are feuding with the Four Horsemen. He thinks about it. He decides he is cheering for the Midnights because they are chasing the world titles. Either way, he and Ricky Morton, maybe they should be tag champs. Or maybe he should challenge Barry Windham for the U.S. title. He says Dusty Rhodes is taking a day off and having a good time. Gary Hart is running his mouth about Dusty's family. He shouldn't. And then I, I lost it after that. Nothing to write home about. Yeah. She murders in the holidays. These holidays are horrible. Brad and Britt Holiday. And we have another match here where the sheep herders, being excellent workers, didn't do one complicated thing in this match. We will clubber you with our forearms. We will stomp you with our boots. Yes. We will choke you with our hands. Yep. And that is 95% of it or more. And the skinny holiday still managed to fuck shit up. Skinny holiday is the worst of the two holidays, Yeah, which, the, which is saying something. They're allegedly brothers, but one's a big fat guy and one's kind of a goofy skinny guy. And, like, they wear the same color. I mean, they wear matching gear. Yeah. Color coordinated gear. But, I mean, the fat one on a scale of 1 to 10 is probably a 3. Sure. His brother's a 1. It's weird. Much better than Don Valentine. Yeah. But, yeah. Valentine's like a minus 10. Easy. He breaks the scale. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Don Valentine is a zero. Every, everyone else in the world is a 10. Yeah, whatever you guys complain about Dave giving a match seven stars, I mean, watch Don Valentine. <laughs> I mean, understand. I understand why. Sometimes the scale has to be broken. So the announcers are talking about whatever fuck else is going on in wrestling, and they they, they mention because the, the... Oh, we didn't... Did we do the Sheep Herders promo already? Is that still a come? Yeah. Yeah. In the Sheep Herders promo, they mention the, the goody goody Minute Express and their girl manager. So, as it's during the Sheep Herders match here, they're talking about Jim Cornette, and Jim Ross drops a line about Jim Cornette's friend Bruce in San Francisco. A subtle line, by which I mean it's not subtle at all if you understand 1980s terminology. Anyway, they pin the skinny dude with a gut buster. Tully, Arn, and JJ come out for a promo. Okay, I got to say something about this. J.J. begins his promo, and he says, You know, I was speaking to a reporter today, and they said, J.J., in your illustrious career, when was the last time that you've been hurt? J.J. said, I told him, believe it or not, I got hurt today. And the reporter said, How'd that happen? And I told him, Cornette made me laugh so hard, my side hurt. He starts laughing, okay? This joke is fucking terrible, okay? <laughs> Here's my point. There's a lot of fans today, and I don't even really blame them because they probably grew up watching the Monday Night Wars and Hall and & Nash and a bunch of other heels trying to be cool, okay? But, like, the whole point of being a heel is not to be cool. Right. It's to be unlikable. Even Tom made fun of my promo at All Pro Wrestling. He's like, what were you doing, a bad stand-up comedy act? Because, like, my first line, one of the ring announcers at the beginning of the show goes, I'm so happy to be back here that I graduated here 15 years ago. And so my, my first line in the promo was like, who was the guy who was so happy to have graduated here 15 years ago? Well, the reason he was so happy is because he hasn't been back here in 15 years. That's a fucking terrible joke. It barely even registers as a joke. That's the fucking point. I'm not out there trying to be cool. J.J. Dillon, everything that he does, he is such a despicable geek. You know what I'm saying? Yes. He lies. 
He's full of shit. He tells jokes that he thinks are funny and he laughs at his own jokes. That's the fucking point of being a heel. The baby faces are the ones who are supposed to be cool. Right? I think so, yes. Am I wrong about this? I just listened to this joke and he was so proud of himself and it was so bad and I just, I loved it. Well, what it leads into is when he says that the, uh, <laughs> he says, talking about how funny Jim Cornette is and he says, you know, the thing of it is, the Midnight Express is going to have to win the belts in the ring, not with one-liners, not with cute comments. We'll see how funny it is when Tully Blanchard hits that slingshot suplex, ha ha ha, <laughs> or when Arn Henderson hits the gourd, gourd buster, Ha ha ha! Things are gonna change. I've had it with both of them, he says. He's such a cocky prick. And he always, in his promos, sets himself up for failure. Yes. It's great. But, but, but first, like I said I've had it with both of them. I'm not sure which of both of them is. But the other thing is, I mentioned earlier, as evil as the Minute Express are, they are fun. Well, <laughs> JJ Dillon doesn't like the Minute Express, and he doesn't want there to be any fun. No. No fun, no jokes. So JJ's a clown, but Arn and Tully are not clowns, and they take this a different way. Tully talks for a bit. He kind of fumbled his lines a bit. I believe at one point he said, psychologize us. <laughs> He's not long for this company. <laughs> he talks about playing mind games. We don't care about Jim Cornette. JJ doesn't take care of you anyway. And then Arn Anderson goes, and Arn was on fucking fire. 42 bashes, he says. The four horsemen went into 42 bashes as, as tag team champions. They came out of 42 bashes still, the world tag team champions. I saw the Midnight Express out here wasting precious interview time. Talking about how cute Stan Lane is. And all the great moves Bobby Eaton can do in the air. But this is a war, but gentlemen. And wars are won and lost in the trenches. Not in the air. We'll win a war. We'll win a wrestling match. Jim Cornette, you are not a variable in any of this, he says. You want to, do the, you want to make this a comedy store? Do it on your own time. We are the class of the sport. We didn't do it by making a lot of wisecracks. All those teams that have come up against, uh, against us, the Road Warriors, Rock and Roll Express, Sting and Nikita, they all came up short. We destroyed them. We'll destroy you, too. And Tully, I guess, realizing he wasn't very good later, tries to save, save himself here. Stan Lane said he put his hands on these belts and said he wants big paydays. Well, the only way to get big paydays is to wrestle the Four Horsemen. And they walk off stage. I'm not sure who it was. One of them forgot his belt on the podium. Hmm. Barry Windham versus Lee Ramsey. I did love the line where Tully's going off on Stan Lane about, you guys said you wanted larger paychecks, and Arn just screams, earn them! <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> that wasn't even Tully's point. No. But Arn had to throw that in there. <laughs> oh, that was great. Barry Windham versus Lee Ramsey. They were right up against the clock. Barry won with a lariat. JJ says Barry's the top, te- top technician in the sport. Barry says, I'm the top of my game. My tactics are at their best. The claw is at its best. You would all better prepare to be beaten very soon. I want to throw in that Lee Ramsey was fine. I, it was a 30-second match. I know, but you didn't fuck anything up. Okay, you're On right. this show, <laughs> well, that's a five. Touche. On a scale of one to ten. Good job, Lee Ramsey. Way to go. <laughs> Excellent work. So, yes, the show was too long, but it definitely had its talking points. That's for sure. Yes. So there you go, NWA World Championship Wrestling. Well, let's get funky like a monkey. Very little happened in the show. Actually, there was an angle in like the very beginning, and that was it. Let's talk about how this show would be different if it were standard time. NWA World Championship Wrestling, August 27th, 1988. We opened with that same clip of Al Perez and Kevin Sullivan attacking Brad Armstrong with a chain. Mm. So the announcers are running down this show. First, they tell us Paul Jones has a challenge for Ricky Morton. And then David... David Crockett, I don't know what he was trying to say, but he confuses himself so badly, he throws it to Jim Ross to try to save the segment, and Ross, being a total pro, takes over and starts going off about what's next, and then Crockett cuts him off. Well, he sort of said, there's going to be an interview with Jim Ross. Right, Jim Ross? I think you... I I don't know. He was confused. I was confused. Like Jim Ross was going to interview himself. It's amazing. There are moments where this trio has just absolutely terrible chemistry. It's amazing. Uh, We are told, by the way... I feel like David Crockett was describing this change to daylight savings time. There's a lot of similarities. So what we'd have, by the way, is our days, the sun would go down later. Okay. But during the winter solstice, 
the sun would not come up until 8.45 a.m. Okay. Oh, that doesn't matter for us. No, I... But little children waiting out at the bus stop? Again, if it were up to me, we'd set the clocks back an hour every day. Kids would be going to school and the moon was out, and I don't care. I would mm. sleep more. Wow. Uh, what a selfish prick. I am completely selfish. Okay. I only care about how this affects me in my life. All right, as long as we got that clear. Yes. Uh, Dusty Rhodes, by the way, has put Ronnie Garvin out of wrestling for four to six months. So... That was a very casual announcement. <laughs> Ronnie has quit. Yes. And I actually don't know if he goes to the AWA first or if he just goes straight to WWF. I don't remember him going to the AWA at all. But quite frankly, the the assumption was he was going to AWA. I think he may have just gone to the WWF. But the point is, he's not out four to six months. No. So Dusty decided he just had to make up a bullshit story, which will be proven to be bullshit very soon. Very soon. (laughs) Yeah. It's weird. It's such a weird way. I went when the when the Why not just say he's a coward? Yeah. Why not just say Dusty beat him up and he tucked his tail and left the territory? That's what they did like two months ago when the powers of pain quit. Yep. And it worked. Instead they were too they were too cowardly to get up on that scaffold. Instead, they claim he's been beaten up so bad he'll be out four to six months, but he's gonna be back earlier, which makes Dusty look weak. Yes. That was very weird. Very odd. And then they also say, Oh, also Bobby Eaton met some very serious misfortune recently at the hands of the four horsemen. There's a lot of announcements here. In this opening tease, that, I guess. That's what they do. They announce things. Nikita Koloff and Ricky Morton versus Max MacGyver and Jerry Price. So I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but Nikita's back to the red singlet he wore when he was the big, scary, evil Russian nightmare. He's still a very large, muscular man, but he's nowhere near as big. And the singlet is too big for him now. But he's put it back on. You know what I noticed in this match was, at one point, Koloff threw what was actually a really good drop kick. Mm-hmm. And then, like, Ricky got in, and I guess he wanted to show him up and throw a drop kick of his own, but Koloff actually threw a better drop kick. Yeah. And then I'm watching it, and Jim Ross is talking about how Nikita used to be a very one-dimensional athlete. He relied very, very heavily on that sickle, which was a great move, mind you, but it's good to expand your palate or whatever. Yeah. So as he's talking, I thought, well, fuck, they can both do a drop kick. They should just continue on with the Rock and Roll Express double drop kick finish. And what did the finish end up being, ironically? The fucking Russian sickle yes. that Ross spent the entire match burying. It that was, was bizarre. It, he said it was a very good move, my It you. was a very good move, that's true. But he just, yeah, he, 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 well, it was first of all funny. They did because I guess Ricky just couldn't just do a sickle. They had to do this convoluted move where Ricky whipped the guy into the ropes and then ducked and then ducked again and finally Nikita hit him. And even Ross is like, we could all see this coming a mile away. And yeah, because the guy had to run like three times. Yes. As Nikita's just standing in the corner. We all know what's going to happen. So, yes, the story is Nikita has been a one-dimensional power wrestler his entire career. Now he has teamed up with Ricky Morton, and Ricky is turning him into a mat wrestler. I'm still not sure why that job had to run so many times. It's like Nikita was there. It was all ready to go, but then he just waited. So the job had to run and, and the, then the, duck and then run the, and then get yes, hit. Yes, yeah. The, the spot is... Ricky whips the guy in, and at this point, Nikita's basically behind Ricky. Yes. So if 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 uh, Ricky does one drop down, the dropper will jump over him, and then Nikita will hit him. Yes. And that would be fine. But no. Instead, he has to jump over Ricky like two or three times. He jumped over him, and then he hit the ropes, and he's running back, and Ricky just got out of the way, and he hit the ropes, yeah. and then he got sickled. <laughs> he just and got out of the way. Immediately when it's over, Jim Ross says... I did not see one example of their double team maneuvering having any... He said something like, everything they did came off perfectly. Yes. They, and I was they, like, except the fucking finish I just watched with my own two eyes. So then they do this promo. Now, I don't know this for sure, but I get the impression that neither Nikita nor Ricky actually wants to be in this team. The first time they were together, Ricky immediately, he was out there by himself, and they asked him about this team, and he tried to blow off the team and try to put himself in position for a singles match until Nikita came off and said, no, no, we're a team. So now they're out there for this promo. Nikita, at some point, just starts grunting unintelligibly. I have no idea what he was trying to say. I have no idea what language he was imitating. I don't know what he was saying. Ricky ignores any tag team situation going on. Says that Paul Jones is trying to use him as a guinea pig to prove Ivan Koloff is still tough. He's going to prove he's not no guinea pig. He's not no stepping stone. And then Nikita says, everyone take a look at Ricky Morton. Nikita is like, one of these. And Nikita says, now look at me. And he does a big giant flex. And though he is much smaller than he used to be, he's still much bigger than Ricky. So it came off like he's trying to say, Ricky is a skinny guy with a mullet. I am a big, scary Russian. 
They seem to be on different pages at pretty much all times. Well, I mean, that is true. Yeah. The Russian Assassin versus Brett Holiday. This match had exactly one highlight. The music? Two highlights. Thank you. Music. And then the Russian Assassin throws Brett Holiday to the floor, and he steps through the ropes, and he stands in the apron. And he raises his hands high in the air for a double axe handle. And he waits. And he waits. And time passes. And he waits. And then he jumps one foot forward and falls straight down and does an axe handle, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say the highlight was when the jobber's out in front of the... Or he's out in front of Paul Jones. And Paul Jones rears back, and he just boots him right in the stomach with his fucking pointy cowboy boot. And Teddy Long is standing right there looking at him. And Teddy goes, knock it off. And I'm like, he fucked him. He fucking kicked him in the stomach with a pointy cowboy boot. That is a disqualification. Teddy Long is the shittiest referee ever. I, 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 I apologize to Nick Patrick. Like, he's fucking incompetent, too. But as I watch these shows, Teddy Long will let anything go. So this match went forever. The Russian assassin is neither skilled nor star, uh, nor has enough star power to carry a match as long as this went. And God knows Brett this Holiday... This was when I knew it was a 90-minute show. Yeah. God knows Brett Holiday is not going to be making up the difference. Eventually, the assassin wins with a Russian guillotine. So then Crockett goes to interview Paul Jones. I got to start this one. <laughs> May I just do his very first line? No, I got to, because that's the whole point of this. All right. David Crockett says, Paul, you've had a bad summer. Yes. Okay. I bury the WWE generic announcing women all the time. You do. For asking such stupid fucking questions. Mm -hmm. And there were at least two instances on this show where... He either made a stupid statement that he shouldn't have made, or he asked a stupid question. But for some goddamn reason, it worked. And I, I, the only thing that I can figure is that there was a sincerity to the way that he asked the question. Where you believed that there was like a method to his madness. There was a reason he asked this question. It was a question designed... For example, in this case, to get Paul Jones to lose his shit, which is exactly what happened. So, somehow, it worked here. But it does not work in WWE where they generically spout out fucking dumb questions. And then, of course, they get buried by the wrestlers for asking dumb questions. Well, I will say this. Uh, it works here if you want to... If I, I, it works better here, I'll say that. Because it is believable. David Crocker, I believe, is dumb enough to ask a question like this. Yes. And then Paul Jones... I believe was sincere in his reply. When the WWE backstage interviewer does it, it sounds like a fake scripted question, and without fail, the talent will respond with a fake scripted response. Not to mention, we also know that the Crockett family owns the promotion, mm -hmm. whereas Kayla is just a random backstage person. So, so, so David can get away with this kind of kind of yeah. No one's It'd be like it. if Stephanie asked a stupid question. No one's going to beat up the boss's brother. No. So he also, I mean, taking it a step farther than just insulting him. By saying you've had a bad summer, he notes, you know, when a baseball team has a bad year, they get rid of the manager. So why are you blaming Ivan Koloff instead of blaming yourself? So Paul Jones, of course, is all fired up now. He's been, to his face, insulted like this. I blame Ivan because he was in the ring. If I had been in the ring, I would have gotten rid of the Road Warriors. I have gotten cards and letters, hate mail from people I recognize, he said. They'd say Ivan is a superb athlete. But Ivan has to prove to me, prove to the mother country of Russia. He still has what it takes. I want Ricky Morton not as a guinea pig, but as a piece of meat. So Ivan can prove himself. Ricky Morton's perfect. He's the all-American boy. He's the apple pie, the Chevrolet, and this and that. That's a quote. So Ricky's all fired up now. He appears. This <laughs> Ricky. This is where this all turned around. And Rick, I love Paul Jones. Ricky says, I'm not a stepping stone for nobody. I'll take a chain match with Ivan Koloff. I'll take a match with you, Paul Jones. And he turns to the Russian assassin. And I swear to the Lord above, we rewound it twice. This is what he actually said. Yes. I'll take you, you six foot ace. I can't even say it. I'll take you. You six foot eight piece of vegetable. You six foot eight piece of vegetable. You six foot eight piece of vegetable. Yes. 
He's so here's where it really gets great. Oh my god. He well, runs first off, first off, you have to understand that when Ricky Morton comes out, Paul Jones has just been talking trash. Mm-hmm. So Ricky Morton comes out and Paul Jones he absolutely shuts his mouth. Oh yes. He backs up so he's literally touching the giant vegetable. Yeah. The Russian assassin. And he somehow manages to curl up into his own skin. I don't even know how he did it. He's so great at being Paul Jones. He sinks down into himself, and he's like, oh, I, I, I can't even explain, because as we'll get to in a moment, as soon as Ricky leaves, he R- turns into a tough guy. Ricky runs his mouth for a bit, and he has his piece. He turns his back on the man and takes two steps, and as soon as he is off camera, speaking of switches being flipped, Paul Jones, throw that hat down. Tear off that vest as dramatically as possible. And it's it's the perfect example of he he wants the assassin to hold him back. But he doesn't want to step forward until he knows the assassin is holding him back. Well, what he does is first he kind of cowers a little. Like he 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 becomes sheepish as Ricky is doing his promo. He does, he does. He's quiet. He kind of makes himself small. He just backs up very close to his guy. And then Ricky leaves. And first he steps forward, he throws down his writing crop and his hat. Writing crop, yes. And then he tears off his jacket, and what he does is he spreads his arms wide and backs up, so the Russian knows to hold him back. Yes. I, the Russian can't help himself. Yes, he if has to hold him back. If a man backs up toward you with his arms outstretched, you'll catch his arms just to block yourself. And he's ranting, and he's raving, and if this assassin wasn't holding me back, I'd blah, blah, blah. He deserves his spot in the Hall of Awesome. He's amazing. This was... This was one of the best things I ever saw Paul Jones do. Oh, yeah, for sure. He was unbelievably great. This is worth watching the show for this Paul Jones spot. So then we had the other good thing on the show. So I I guess they mentioned it in the opening anyway, but before showing the footage, Jim Ross tells us what we're going to see, which is that Bobby Eaton got beaten up. He got beaten up because Cornette wanted to prove that Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane are great singles wrestlers. So Stan Lane won the coin flip. So he's in the ring having a singles match, and Jim Cornette is at ringside. Against a fucking jobber. Curtis Thompson, I believe. <laughs> yes. So we go to the ring for Stan Lane versus Curtis Thompson, and Cornette's running his mouth on commentary, being very Jim Cornette, and suddenly Teddy Long runs out with frantic news. And he's very frantic about Cornette. Cornette knows this is serious. Cornette jumps like in the Teddy apron. Teddy Long cares about anyone's well-being. Well, I'm sure he's on... Corn- bullshit. Probably Mama Cornette has him on the payroll. So Cornette jumps in the apron and starts screaming, Bobby is unconscious. And Cornette and Stan flee to the back. Which means that, yes, technically, Curtis Thompson is a count-out win over Stan Lane. Well, maybe they may have just thrown the match out. We never heard a bell. I suppose that's true. They run to the back, and there's Bobby Eaton on the floor, laid out and bleeding. And they throw a tantrum. Cornette and Stan do. They're throwing the chair around. Cornette screaming for the cops. They're furious. So we go back in the studio where the Minute Express is there. Bobby Eaton has the most ridiculous makeup on until this meeting. It's the only negative about this segment because everything else was awesome. He literally, there was like a... It's like, it's like red, wet red paint. There was a gob of paint on his yes. cheek. Like the rest of him, he had bandages on and they kind of put some makeup on that sort of thing. But what was it with the red gob of bright red paint? It's like you just picked the well, not even a scab. It's a, it's no, a, it's, it's it was big, just a perfect circle of round red paint. Yeah, it's huge. So, Cornette's all fired up, of course. Bobby Eaton would have given you the shirt off his back, Arn Anderson, and instead you and your geek friends took it upon yourself to tear that shirt off his back. He's got the shirt in his hand. He's waving it around. Says this isn't the first time. Or yeah, you've jumped on a bunch of guys. You've jumped on Dusty Rhodes. You've jumped on the Road Warriors. Well, this time you've jumped on someone who will jump you back. We've been beaten up worse than this, and we've beaten people up worse than this. And he is so flummoxed with rage that he can't talk anymore. And Stan Lane, who never talks, has to take over. You know, shit's serious when Stan Lane cuts a promo. And Stan says the only thing this beating proves is that the four horsemen are scared of a fair fight. They know we'll win two on two. They try to take one of us out. And then, like... <laughs> Haley's Comet appeared. If Stan Lane rarely speaks, Bobby Eaton speaks once every 86 years or so. Teller spoke. <laughs> it's even better, actually. Yes. Thank you. Teller, as it turns out, cuts a hell of a promo. It wasn't a great promo, but like compared to the promos today, 
it would have been in the top like two percent. It was a great promo because as a guy who never ever speaks, he spoke with sincerity and authenticity and believability. Yes, the fans this, the fans went dead silent when he spoke mm-hmm. because he never does. And when he was done, they went, Yeah. This was a pissed off redneck who's in a fighting mood. I've been wrestling since I was 16 years old, he says. And yeah, I've lost some matches, but I've never lost a fight. Never. Until three men jump me in that locker room. But next time, boys, it won't be one on three. It'll be three on three. And you're going to end up looking a whole lot worse than this. And that was it. That's all he had to say. That's like word for word what he said. Yep. And they left and the fans are going crazy. This was awesome. Rick Steiner versus Keith Steinborn for the Florida title, which still exists for some reason. Let me tell you something. If I was Keith Steinborn and my opponent turned out to be Rick Steiner and this fucking Teddy Long was a referee, I just walked right out. This Teddy Long lets anything go. I'm in there with a madman and Kevin Sullivan's on the outside. So That's a recipe for death. So a couple things. First of all, Keith Steinborn is a satchel ass. I just noticed that in this show. So there was a point here. It, oftentimes during these boring squash matches, I will look away and something will happen. I'll ask you what happened. That's not what happened in this case. I was watching the screen and I couldn't believe my eyes with what I saw. And I asked what happened. And you said he had a gonzo bomb. Now, That's I know what happened. I know what that is. And obviously, you know what that is. I don't think in the 15 years we've been doing shows, either of us has ever said he hit a gonzo bomb. Well, maybe some old All Japan we watched, but... It's very rare. Steiner put Certainly his, not on a Saturday night afternoon or Saturday afternoon squash match. Steiner lifted him up like he was going to do a power bomb, mm-hmm. but then he let his head hang down, yes, like almost in a Styles Clash position, and then just leaped in the air and <laughs> dropped onto his knees, and Keith Steinborn landed on his fucking head. Yeah. This was a spot in the middle of a match. <laughs> Of a squash match. Then he grabbed his ponytail, and he lifted him up again, and he beat him up some more. And he beat him up, and he hit him with moves, and he kept refusing to get the pin, and he suplexed him, and he threw him around, and finally he gave him a belly-to-belly and pinned him. A fucking massacre. (laughs) But I I enjoyed it immensely. And nobody was killed, so we can laugh about it. I believe at one point Steiner said, I'm just going to arm drag this guy and not tell him. And he's grabbed him by the arm and yanked him through the air. That's what happened. A few times. And yes, he won with a belly to belly. Al Perez versus Gary Royal. So, I'm not sure how, but the, 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 the attacking Brad Armstrong with the chain is somehow going to lead to a dog collar match. In fact, I'll go back. Al Perez attacking Brad Armstrong with a chain is going to lead to a dog collar match between Kevin Sullivan and Dusty Rhodes. I don't connect these dots, but that's what we're being told. Uh, it is made very clear that, yes, Dusty Rhodes took out Ron Garvin in a parking lot, but he didn't jump him from behind. Oh. So we've been watching Al Perez for a long time now. Looks good. Very good athlete. Technically skilled. No personality at all whatsoever. And I believe this is the week where Al just got bored with himself. And he began to make up moves on the spot. And lest you think it's just you and I saying that, Tony Schiavone noted, this Al Perez comes up with new moves every week. At one point before the spinning toe hold, he had the man flat on his back, and he lifted his legs up into the air, and he grabbed his feet as if he was going to perhaps stomp his gut like Bret Hart used to do, Mm -hmm. or myself, one of my new moves. When you imitated Bret Hart, yeah. Yeah. Instead, he just separated the guy's legs. I, I believe what he was doing there, I think he planted his knees into the man's hamstrings. Well, he just made him do the splits. Well, yeah. And then he gave up into the spinning toe hold. This was just boring. I actually like right before that when he, he was behind the guy and he hooked the arms for a tiger suplex. But instead of suplexing him... He just like rolled him to his back and tried to pin him and got stuck and got stuck and then and then Gary Royal's trying to put his fucking shoulders on the ground but he can't figure out how to do it yes and so finally Al Perez let's let go let's go this is the, that was that was one of the new moves he made up the only good thing about this match was when Gary Hart said that he would horrify us later 
by showing us how the dog collar works. <laughs> In case you were so goddamn stupid that you couldn't figure out how the dog collar worked. Yeah. This was going to horrify us, he said. David Crockett interviews J.J. Dillon. This was the other one. David, in the middle of his interview, goes, J.J., you must be scared. And I was like, what a fucking ballsy statement. <laughs> well, it's funny. His first question, okay, there has been th- th- this Midnight Express Four Horsemen feud has progressed logically, uh, but, but each week there's been an escalation. And now it's really, really gotten physical. They try to take out Bobby Eaton. They jumped him in the locker room and tried to end this once and for all. But Crockett asks a question about Sting and Barry Windham. And I think to myself, is this the most important manner on J.J. Dillon's plate this week? And even J.J. notes, and J.J. starts this, he's very thoughtful, his arms are crossed, he's chewing on his glasses, deep in thought. And Crockett asks him about Sting and Windham, and J.J.'s like, you know, it's funny you should phrase it that way. Because, yes, Ric Flair's got a lot going on. Barry Wyndham has got a lot going on. But it seems like you are trying to avoid the question of what happened between the Four Horsemen and the Midnight Express. Now, I'm going to bring it up because it all falls into one big pile. The Midnight Express are no different than Sting and Lex Luger and Nikita Koloff and the Road Warriors. Now, they're all looking up at us. Now, Ric Flair is the World Heavyweight Champion. Tully Blanchard and uh, Art Anderson are the world tag team champions. For those three men, they can't look up. There's nowhere else to go. They can only look down at you. Now, Barry Windham, he's the U.S. champion. He is one step below them, it's true. But he's happy with the status. He's happy to be a part of the Four Horsemen. Happy to team with world champions like Ric Flair and Tully Blanchard and Art Anderson. Now, while the rest of you are looking up at us, Jimmy Cornette, you should be looking behind you because some other team might take the U.S. titles out right right off from under you. Regardless, we're going to keep your attention. We're going to keep slapping you around. I thought it was great. I love the line about, uh, you must be scared. And J.J. momentarily gets flustered and just says, the only thing I'm scared of is finding someone to count my money. I loved it. So we go to commercial when we come back. It's Tully Blanchard and, and uh, Arn Anderson versus Brad Holiday and Lee Ramsey. The best part of this match is Tully decides it's time for Lee Ramsey to tag out. So he's going to let him, he says, you know, probably just says, hit me a few times to make a tag. And Lee Ramsey may have never thrown punches before in his life. He certainly wasn't expecting to here. He has no idea what to do. And so he just throws the funniest flurry of short range wrist punches to the body like he just rears back about this far and with his fist in this position swings it six inches forward and hits Tully in the ribs over and over repeatedly well the idea is you close your hand in a fist like that so the the flat part of your knuckles is there and you whack the guy to make a noise that may have been the idea he didn't do it very well his execution was very 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 poor why did he have an elbow pad around his left tricep? He had an elbow pad over his uh, upper arm. Yeah, yeah it was around his, like his bicep <laughs> tricep area. Well, like, uh, you know what that's supposed to be doing, you idiot? <laughs> Maybe it's making his triceps look bigger. I don't know. So they took time during this match to show a fan from Tokyo. Oh my god, this fan from Tokyo, they said, is a huge wrestling fan. He came to America just to go to Atlanta to watch NWA on TBS. So tell us the story. He looked bored out of his <laughs> fucking mind. <laughs> And finally, he sees the camera on him, and he smiles, goes back to watching the thing. I howled. That Mm. was the fan of the week, I guess. Tully eventually won with a slingshot suplex. So they go to commercial, and they come back, and Tully is trying so hard, so hard to cut a promo, David Crockett won't shut up, and he won't get the hint. And every time Tully tries to cut in, Crockett just steamrolls on through. So finally... (laughs) <laughs> Tully, who is a pro, he just shuts up. He lets Crockett... Clearly, David's going to speak as long as he wants to. So he just lets David finish and completely ignores the question and says what he was going to say anyway. Now, the best part about this is, of course, their heels. So he claims that Bobby Eaton lied to the public. It's a lie. He says J.J. was not there. It was... Myself and Arn. Yes. Okay, so first off, 
it was two of them. He's still not denying. <laughs> to Tully, it was a fair two-on-one beating. Yes. Three-on-one is unfair, okay? Don't you dare accuse us of but taking unfair advantage. Two-on-one is okay. We don't do two-on-one. I, I can't remember the exact number, but like to, to, to be considered a serial killer... It's like you must kill four people. Okay. You kill three people, you're like a mass murderer or something like that. I forget the exact designation. Sure. That's in Tully's mind. If if it's three on one, that's despicable. That's cowardly. Two on one, that's, that's okay. That's business. That's business. So then he claims JJ wasn't there, and it was just the two of us because Flair and Wyndham were in the, the ring. Which we know is not true. Yes, we were watching the match. That was not the match in the <laughs> ring. So he's lying again right here. Unless there's another ring somewhere. He is accusing the man of lying by lying through his teeth about the man. <laughs> this was fucking great. I like the where he says, I can't blame you too much because we were hitting you so hard and so fast, you probably thought it was nine people. <laughs> so Tully has been cutting this promo. He, he's not joking, but there's a... There's an air of, of, I don't want to say comedy, but he's not quite taking this too seriously. He's lying his ass off the whole time. But they go to Arn, and Arn is taking this deadly serious. First thing, he's, he doesn't deny anything. but Except when they say that the horsemen tried to take Bobby out and they were scared. Bobby, he says, if we wanted to take you out, we would have taken you out. And your family keeps calling me. I'm tired of taking your collect calls. The thing is, he says... When you are a champion in a cutthroat sport like this, it's like cheating on your wife. If you're going to be accused of it, you might as well go on and do it. So people are saying the horsemen like to double team guys. We'll double up on you. And after all, what did you expect, Bobby Eaton, when you came for our meal ticket? And he tells a story about how the Midnight Express... Are like two dogs, two dumb dogs chasing They're a Mercedes down the street. Two little dogs chasing that Mercedes, and they all want to catch that Mercedes till one day that Mercedes, I think he said it bumps the dogs into the ditch. Something. I thought he was going to say he was going to run those goddamn dogs over, yeah. but instead they just bump the dogs into the ditch, and those dogs realize they don't want any piece of that Mercedes. Those dogs should have been happy squatting on fire hydrants. I've never heard a guy cut a promo with a story like that. That when it was over, you were like, I'm terrified. <laughs> Arn Anderson was great. You this see. guy's in town. I'm getting out of town. Uh, you know what I'm not going to do? He told a story about dogs pissing on a fire hydrant. You know what I'm not going to do ever in my life is threaten Bobby uh, Arn Anderson's meal ticket. Yeah. Don't mess with it. And it's not worth the trouble. Oh, God. Brad Armstrong and Gary Phelps. But that guy from Tokyo was thrilled about right now. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Fucking painfully boring. It goes forever. Side rush and leg sweep. Let's move on. I'll move on, because you know what was right after the match? Armstrong cut a promo. He did. Now, this week, he didn't try to rap. That's true. So, long story short, he offered Dusty his help. But the point of this is, this was not a great promo, but this absolutely was not a bad promo. It was a perfectly fine promo. And when I watched it, I was like, you are the road dog's brother. Yes. There fucking is something here. There's something there, here. There's a human being inside of you. But it's your fucking goddamn boring ass matches. Yes. I don't give a shit how technically solid you are. These matches are fucking boring, and you're going 50 50 with a goddamn jobber doing fucking arm drags for 10 minutes. That's the problem here. He had some charisma. It wasn't all coming out here, but there was enough coming out here that I thought you could fucking do something with this guy. But then I watched his match, and I was like, Get him off my television. If you ignore his mid-promo coughing fit, which is, hey, shit happens. But, yes, he got a... It was a fine promo building to a match with Dusty Rhodes. Or or a match for Dusty Rhodes, I should say. He was cutting a promo on Dusty's behalf. I guess he's also going to fight Al Perez, but really he was getting a promo about how this is all leading to a match for Dusty. What's funny about his mid-match coughing fit is... You know who else used to do that? Was Buddy... Would always be clear in his throat. Need to apologize. Be tell the story. Go. <laughs> Sorry, all the time. Do you remember this? <laughs> yes, yes. And you know who else? I could I could swear that I've oh, done. God, he does. Yeah, there 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 have been a fair number of like he wasn't. I guess he was sort of southern, but I mean southern style guys that have that thing when they talk. They're they're regularly clearing their throat and apologizing. It's just I just heard it and I was like. I, I know this. Like, there was nothing in his throat. 
This is how he talks. He clears his throat every now and then and apologizes. It's just weird. Brought me back. So Gary Hart and Al Perez are out there, and they're demonstrating how a dog collar works. Oh. Oh, my God. So here's how it works, everyone. You take Kevin Sullivan and put a collar on his neck. <laughs> the end. So now the story has changed. It was not just that Dusty Rhodes took Ronnie Garvin out. Dusty Rhodes annihilated Ronnie Garvin. And Hart says, yes, it's true this happened, but I wanted to note this took place outside the confines of the arena. In the arena, he says, it's a combat zone. Outside the arena, outside the building, you're not expecting to be attacked. Now, if you, he says, if you have any compassion for wrestling, please write a letter to TBS. Let them know there's no place for someone as sadistic as Dusty Rhodes in the show. Then he says he chose... He says that, by the way, with Kevin Sullivan standing right there. Well, not only, not only with Kevin Sullivan right there, but he then says he chose a dog collar match because it's the most violent, dangerous match there is and the best way to get rid of Dusty. A very, very fine bit of heel hypocrisy right there. Not only that, he says there's no place for a sadistic person like Dusty. And then we have clips of Dusty attacking Perez at a show. Sullivan rushes in with a fucking golden spike, <laughs> jabs him in the fucking eyeball twice, and he's bleeding all over the place. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Garvin has to come out to make the save. And I was like, you know, that was kind of sadistic. That he was... just took a golden spike and tried to stuff it into his eye socket. It was not pacifistic, that's for sure. No. So... You come back and now Sullivan's ranting and raving. Dusty Rhodes has proven that rich people can get away with anything. That's right. Meanwhile, they just stuck a spike in somebody's eye. Yes. But goddamn, Dusty can just get away with anything. This man is sick and... This man, he says about Dusty, this man is sick and demented. Then he begins to froth at the mouth. He's... This is legit being held back. He is trying to get to the camera, biting and snarling and spitting. He's so close to the camera that he is blurry as everyone else in the background is in focus. And Al is legitimately holding him back by the chain around his neck. Gary Hart is cutting this promo. Sullivan is throthing or frothing into the camera. Whatever I said. Yes. And what's his name? Al. Al Perez. <laughs> so fucking boring. He's holding Sullivan back, but he's practically l laughing <laughs> at how ridiculous this is. Yes. And Sullivan's just like a crazy man. And then Hart finishes his, his deal and he goes, Come and get it! Come and get it! He's pounding on the table. And I watched this, and I just thought, these men are having the time of their fucking lives. Oh, I'm sure that's true. I am they certain that's true. They are having the time of their lives right now. It's, it's a great team because Gary Hart is a brilliant talker. Al Perez is a very pretty man with no personality. Kevin Sullivan is a lunatic. They all complement each other very, very well. Yes. So Dusty comes out for his rebuttal promo. There's not that much to it. It's nah, a dusty there were, promo. There were a couple people booing. Ronnie learned the hard way about taking $50,000 to try and take him out. He has been feuding with Gary Hart for a long time. He's coming for Hart, Perez, and Sullivan. Your devilish ways are over, he says. I'll put the dog collar on and choke you down. Yeah, as noted, some boos for Dusty here. To be fair, there were there, it may have just even been one person, but there was a definite heel fan this week. Oh, well, sure, yeah, but yeah. I mean, there were people booing. Yeah. Sting versus Cruel Connection. Wasn't it Cruel Connection 1 and 2? Well, he, uh, the graphic here just reads Cruel Connection. Then the announcers are trying to figure out which one it is. Is this 1 or is this 2? Uh, I see. We'll find out when he takes the cape off. And when he took the cape off, they discovered it's 1. Oh. They very wow. excitedly say it's 1. Now, oh. I don't know. Sting and the Cruel Connection may have had this exact same match on Saturday afternoon like 18 times over the next year. But I remembered so much of this match because... It's Sting doing a comedy squash with Cruel Connection 1. He put in some time this week. He did. Probably like four minutes. He did. So he did my favorite spot, maybe, well, certainly that Sting does. He puts on the full Nelson, and the Cruel Connection tries to break this up by putting both feet on the top rope. Yes. He must break the hold. Yes. So the referee begins to count one, two, and Sting is protesting. Ref, I can't let him go. Ref, I can't let him go. Ref! And finally, it gets to five. He has no choice. He must release the full Nelson, which leaves Cruel Connection fl uh, flying down to earth and slamming into the mat. Sting was having the time of his life. I latch. So Sting does the same spot Al did where he just spread the man's legs. Only Cruel Connection is gross and smelly. So Sting has to let go because yes. it's so gross. His groin stinks. His groin <laughs> stinks. I'm sure 
This is uh, 88. 13 year old Vinny was laughing his ass off at this point. And then Sting has had enough. He wins with the Singer Splash and Scorpion Leg Lock. Then cuts his promo and he just starts to whisper. He tells the fans, shh, you gotta whisper. Because if, we, if I talk too loud, I'm gonna scare Barry Windham. I don't wanna scare him. I don't wanna scare him. He cuts this very quiet promo. And then when he's done, he stops. He looks right at David. And he fucking screams at the top of his lungs right into David's face like a complete madman. And off he goes, and I thought, I love this guy. Sting, mm. every promo he does is absolutely different and memorable from the one he's done before. That is very true. The best thing about this is he's doing the gimmick of whispering, and obviously it's a gimmick. Obviously, you know, we're not supposed to believe that he's going to be quiet so as not to scare Barry Windham. He's just saying Barry Windham is scared. And he's looking at the camera. If I rant and rave, Barry will be frightened. Barry, I very badly want a match with you for the U.S. title. I'm looking forward to wrestling you all over the country. But every once in a while, there's that one fan, the one heel fan, who will chant, Barry, Barry. And Sting will be whispering, and he'll stop and point and say, I'll deal with you later. Barry, listen closely. <laughs> and then, of course, he screams as loudly as he can. All the veins in his neck are popping out. His eyes are bolting out. And David loved it. I loved it. He screamed at me. <laughs> he went, ow, at me. What a, what a great segment this was by Sting, the match and the promo. This was better than I remember going back over this now. Well, then we have a Lex promo. This was not bad, but he, also, he also got booed. And booed. he acknowledged it. And he did rip his T-shirt off, and there was one woman who was very, very happy to see him with no shirt on. Sure, sure. And she was also very, very happy later to see Ric Flair, so yeah. not discerning. Well, Lex begins by saying, you know, I saw Sting out here, and Sting's right. It's not the time to scream. And you know, when Sting said he wasn't going to scream and shout, I was intrigued to see where this was going to go and how it was going to develop. When Lex Luger says, I'm not going to scream and take my shirt off, I thought, well, this is going to be a very boring promo then. And for the most part, it was. But he did. I did like where he noted Rick Flair has wrestled our Broadways. Yeah. We've seen it for years. And that one horseman fan got under his skin. He tore his shirt off. And he screamed for a while, and that was it. Uh, Dr. Death versus The Menace. So speaking of The Menace and Dr. Death, he was currently in legal trouble. Oh. He was caught with drugs, mm. trying to head to Japan. Three grams of coke, 22 grams of pot, two grams of mushrooms, assorted barbiturates, 240 steroid tablets, oh. 28 milliliters of injectable steroids. They wanted to get him on distribution. Yeah. But apparently, I, I presume that he convinced him it was all for him. And if I recall correctly, he got off. Oh. But he wasn't going to be able to go to Japan. No. So he was here wrestling. No. Yeah. Well, that's all way more interesting than anything that happened here. Power Slam finish. Dr. Did his stuff in one. <laughs> a Ric Flair promo. You know, this is going to sound... This is not breaking news, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that Ric Flair is great, or this was one of the best promos I've seen on the show in months, both of which are true. But it really hit me that the top two wrestling champions of the 80s were both personifications of the 80s in totally different ways. Yes. Hulk Hogan was a big giant, jacked-up bodybuilder, everything in excess, larger than life. Straight out of a cartoon. And fucking Ric Flair was the exact same thing, but financially. He was lifestyles of the rich and famous. He had a lot yes, of money. He, was, he flaunted it. He was Dallas. He was Dynasty. He drove fast cars the whole nine yards. That's, those were the two big champions of the 80s. Yes. Were those two guys. Yes. Maybe. And they were totally different, but in some ways they were exactly the same. Yeah. So Flair's promo this week, not quite sure what got under his skin. Maybe somebody questioned his Hey, I got to add, by the way, mm -hmm. he was universally cheered. Oh, yes. There, there were a couple well, of people that booed Dusty. There were a couple of people that booed Lex. Nobody booed Rick. He partly, was their guy. Partly because this is basically a babyface promo. He starts out by saying... I made $2 million last year. Which in the 80s, that's a babyface promo. Yeah. I did it without a law degree, without running a corporation, without running for president, which he threatened to do. He's not followed through on that threat yet. But he says, this college dropout 
who ran with any woman who would have him since he was 15 years old, is the very best in that ring. And everyone cheers. He says, everyone in this, every star in this sport is a millionaire. Dusty Rhodes is a millionaire. Lex Luger, who was in the NFL for nine years, which is news to me. He's a millionaire in his first year in the sport, and that's all thanks to me. Lexi says, when you were playing football, all your buddies were telling him, hey, last week on TBS, the champ beat up Dusty Rhodes. And now, Lex Luger, you come into my world, you're trying to take, and he picks up the belt, my baby. You're trying to take my baby from me. He goes off about the planes and the cars and the big house and the nice side of town and all that. And finally, he says, he, any major city, Lex, in all my magnificence, you're going to be mine all night long. It was great. It's awesome. It's awesome promo. Literally one of the best Flair promos I've seen on the show. The la- Flair always cuts great promos, but like a lot of the promos are the same promo. He's bragging about women. He's bragging about this. He, 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 he kind of gets serious at the end, but rarely do you see like a full serious promo. I don't think we've seen a full serious promo since he lost to Ronnie Garvin, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden he wasn't the nature boy anymore, and so he was morose. This, for whatever reason, was just serious from start to finish. There was no talking about the women. I mean, there was talking about the women because, like, he's Ric Flair and he gets all the women. But it was not like, here's, but here's even- where we'll be staying. I hope to see all the ladies there. I mean, every reference to wo- women was to him related to how great he was. And even then, his exact words were, any woman who would have him. So it... Usually he's out talking about how he only gets tens. This week there may have been some threes and fours in there if they were the one that happened that week. He, he, there was in in his own way, <laughs> in his own way, this was Ric Flair showing a, a a a shade of humility, which is usually lacking from Ric Flair promos. Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin versus Agent Steel. The best thing to happen to Jim Ross of all of nineteen eighty eight. Was a rookie in the NFL being an out an, an, an out and out Ric Flair mark. Brad Muster, a rookie in the Chicago Bears, wearing a Ric Flair t shirt, taping his fingers like Ric Flair, getting it mentioned on TV. Best thing that ever happened to Jim Ross. He's so happy to talk about this. Talked about it for an hour. He was hoping the match went longer. Jimmy won with a brain buster. By the way, Garvin and Precious are just randomly back together, happy as can be. Well, they were off TV for a while. They, they did the Tower of Doom. Yeah, they did the Tower of Doom, but it was like, I don't know. They haven't, I don't think they've been on TV since, I don't think. No, and, and I mean, she did, I mean, she did end up with him at the end, but I mean, they had a lot of problems going in, mm-hmm. and she slapped him, and... It, she did? She they, was, there were all these problems. Get your hands off me, Jimmy Garvin. We Garner. never found out what Sullivan's envelope was all about. No, that, that, part, that part did totally that get dropped. That just vanished. Like, what the fuck happened here? What did I miss? I don't know. It was just weird. They came out together... Am I the only one that noticed that? I, I know you're right. They, 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 they're just back now. It's like the whole thing never happened. And didn't Sullivan give the envelope to Crockett and said, he like... Or Ross, one of the two. He gave it He gave it to one of them, and he yeah. told him to read it, and then, like, we never heard anything about it again. The whole thing's got dropped. So this had to be a rib of Mike Rotunda. Maybe it had to do with Ronnie, and he left. I may mean, have. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the story was supposed to be that Precious was Sullivan's sister. Yes. You don't really need Ronnie there for that, unless they're going to do Sullivan and Ron Garvin. It just doesn't make any sense. It's just weird. It's very weird. So this had to be a rib on Mike Rotunda. He's one of the sweatiest wrestlers you'll ever see. So they put him in there with a guy named Eddie Sweat. Yeah. It was also a rib on Mike Rotunda, because Eddie Sweat sucks. Rotunda goes, all he wants to do is whip the guy in and hit a back elbow. It takes him like three tries to start and stop and just do the whip into the ropes. And when he finally gets it right, even in the middle of the whip, Rotunda is rolling his eyes at the camera. So now he's pissed off. And when you're pissed off with a jobber, what do you do? You throw him outside so Kevin Sullivan can kill him. Mission accomplished. And eventually Rotunda won with a double arm suplex and he did nothing in this match. But you know what? He was sweating his ass off of his promo. He puts Dr. Death over. Puts the University of Oklahoma over, but says, Oklahoma cannot buy you this title. 
Dr. Death, I know you have paid all these referees off. I know you've got all these stupid fans following you. But I know where I want my next title defense to be. I want it to be in the state of New York. Because anything west of there is just camping out. So he begins to list, list cities. And of course he doesn't want it in Manhattan or Brooklyn. He wants it in Binghamton or Syracuse or Rochester, anywhere. You can't buy a ref off there, Dr. Death. So then Sullivan says, you know, it's in the World Championship Wrestling or the uh, NWA contracts that if you can beat the television champion, you get, I, I believe he said a $10,000 $10, bonus. But it's not a bonus. We all know it's not a bonus. That's a bounty they've put on this champion. I do. It's a do, great line. I do love that everybody has the ten thousand dollar bonus. Yeah, but when it's his guy, it's a bounty. Of course, of course. It's je- they're all jealous of Mike Rotunda. There's a lot of jealousy in Rotunda. Doctor Death, you're the most jealous of all. The number one man who is jealous is Doctor Death, and he storms off screen. I love that Sullivan. He he has things that he needs to say. He says them, and then he's done. He. Wraps up his promos. Yes. He, he slams the door on these. Yes. He's not like some of these guys just kind of ramble on for a while. No. He, he gets his shit out and he's done. Yes. He's not getting paid by the his hour. His 60 to 0 time is fantastic. Yes. Excellent. And uh, yeah. Th- you know what? That seemed like a really boring show watching it. Somehow recapping it seemed more interesting. I wrote pretty good show in my notes when it was over. Hmm. I, I didn't know if I'd have anything to talk about, but god damn, we went 55 minutes, so must have been some stuff on there. So anyway, check it out. If for only one reason, Paul Jones responding to Ricky Morton, which hopefully leads to Paul Jones-Ricky Morton matches, but I doubt it. 